disappear. Uh, if anything, uh, not as much cloud around tomorrow. So a better chance of seeing longer spells of sunshine, but it ain't going to warm things up very much. Another cold one tomorrow. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, it's 3pm. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. In a few minutes' time, I'll be joined by the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, Captain Lee Anderson. And as usual, he's got plenty to say. Next up, Liberal Democrat leader Ed Davey is facing calls to quit for his role in the post office scandal. Well, this fellow's called for other people to quit 31 times in the past, so is it time for Ed Davey to get the high jump? And with much of the country underwater, Sir Keir Starmer has said the government's response to flooding is not good enough. But would you welcome an MP in Wellies to your flood site anyway? And did you know that today is National Divorce Day? Yes, more people split up on this day than on any other day in the entire year. And we'll help to make that as painless as possible. That's all coming up in the next hour.
So welcome to the show. Here we are from Westminster. I want to hear from you. Email me all the usual ways. GBviews at GBnews.com. We've got lots on the way, including Lee Anderson, who's just walked in now. He's raring to go for a few minutes' time. But first, here's the latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB newsroom. The Prime Minister says he'd strongly support a decision to revoke the former post office boss's CBE. Paula Venels routinely denied there were problems with the Horizon IT system, which made it look like money was missing from shops. Hundreds of staff were convicted, jailed, bankrupted and some took their lives after they were wrongly accused of theft. The Justice Secretary and post office ministers are now looking at how to help those who were caught up in the scandal. One of the other victims, Christopher Head, says he doesn't believe the fault lies with just one person. The reason that Paula Vanells has been singled out is because she was, being, she was made aware on countless occasions of the problems. And obviously she was in the position at that particular time to do something about it and failed to do so. So I think that is why that's been the case. But, you know, you, you roll back over the years that, you know, there is obviously people in Fujitsu. There is people in government or ministers or even, you know, civil servants that maybe try to have damage limitation, let's say, in order to try and make this a hope that it will go away. So there's there's countless number of people. So you had previous CEOs at post office of Adam Crozier. There's, you know, there's just, there's, the list is endless. So we, we need the inquiry to finish so we get to the bottom of that and obviously for the, the Met Police to do their investigation. Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Bim Afalami, says the government is working as quickly as it can to compensate the victims. It's worth saying that everybody involved with the post office Horizon scandal, 100% of them have received interim payments of over £168,000. That isn't enough, that that's an interim payment. We've brought forward a bill going through Parliament, should clear Parliament in the next week or so, so that we don't have to wait for the results of the inquiry, so that we can get this compensation paid in full as soon as possible. In addition to that, the Lord Chancellor, who's head of the justice system, is meeting with other colleagues across government later today to see how much faster we can make sure they have the legal redress as well as the financial redress. We want to get this sorted as soon as we possibly can. Labour MP Kevin Jones is pushing for emergency legislation to exonerate the victims. It's what I've come to expect over the years uh, from the post office. It's been lies and cover-ups all along. Uh, but the key point is we've got to get these convictions overturned because they're quite clearly unsafe. Fresh ice warnings have been issued for parts of Britain as temperatures plummet and snow and sleet showers cover the country. The Met Office issued a yellow warning for ice across the southern England and South Wales, which will last until tomorrow morning. An amber cold health alert has been issued for parts of England, with the cold snap set to continue throughout the week. Meanwhile, Sir Kistama is visiting the flood-hit East Midlands today. It comes as Labour has accused the government of being asleep at the wheel over flood warnings. More than 160 flood warnings remain in place across the country and over 1,800 properties have been damaged. Rishi Sunak tried to defend his record whilst visiting flood-hit residents yesterday, saying the government has invested £5.2 billion in flood defences. This isn't the first time I've been out to talk to residents in this situation. I've got to get ahead of this. And that means earlier in the year, in the autumn, having a task force that brings together local authorities, the emergency response, local people, to ensure that the prevention work is done. Some of the drains that are now being cleaned could have been cleaned beforehand. The response wasn't quick enough. So I just don't think it's good enough for the government to come after the event again and express empathy, get ahead of this with a task force. That's what I would do. Actor Idris Elba is calling for an immediate ban on machetes and so-called zombie knives. The Hollywood star spoke to the families of those who lost their loved ones to youth violence as he launches his Don't Stop Your Future campaign. Folded outfits, each representing someone who has died through knife crime, is being displayed in Parliament Square in central London. The Home Office last summer said tougher measures on such knives would be introduced, but legislation hasn't yet passed through the Commons. He says although deterrents like stop and search powers are somewhat working, much more needs to be done. It makes me feel sad as a society that we aren't putting as much focus as we should be 
on, on, on stopping this, okay? And I just, I think today's campaign launch is about just re-energizing re, um, uh, the government to think about this, re-energizing our society to think about this as a group and say, all right, how can we stop this? This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on your digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now it's back to Martin. Thank you, Sophia. Now we've got lots of crack, crack through this hour, so let's get going. From Westminster, I'm joined in the studio by the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, Mr Lee Anderson. Lee, welcome to this, this pristine you, new studio. Now then, um, we need to talk about the post office scandal. So, so Rishi Sunak um, has been, been very outspoken today about the fact um, that Victor's been treated appallingly. What's your take on this absolute scandal? It is a scandal, Martin. It's something I've raised uh, in Parliament in the past, because I had a, uh, a postmaster affected by this uh, it's, the scandal. There's no other word for it. Um, I'm just looking at, I mean, the TV programme, I have actually caught a little bit of that, and that's really brought it to the, you know, to the to the public, mm. uh, the great British public, and it's an absolute scandal. I mean, I saw Ed Davey bleating on in the paper, mm. uh, I think, over the weekend. Um, here's, a, here's a case of a man who's um, not that relevant at the moment, but this sort of scandal has brought him back to the forefront of, of British politics, all for the wrong reasons, uh, may I add. And it would appear that in the past, when he was the, the, the post office minister, that he took the side of the employee uh, of the employers over the workers. Now, as MPs, Martin, yep. we often get cases coming to, to, into our surgeries, into our office, and there's always two sides to every argument. And as, as an MP, you have to look at both sides, speak to the victims and, uh, and whoever, the perpetrators, and sometimes it's a completely different story when you get to the bottom of it. And this, this, this man, this, this Ed Davey, is not really looked at both sides of the story. He's took the side uh, of, of, the, uh, of the post office employers and, sadly, Many went to prison to, you know, in not listening. And some took their lives and they can't be brought back. <laughs> so Ed Davey is a guy who's very trigger happy when he's normally asking for people to resign yes. over political scandals 31 times, in yeah. fact, Lee. He's demanded people get the hijum. Is it time for him to get the hijum? Well, I think the thing is, Martin, if he actually resigned, nobody would notice. So he can, he can carry on spouting his nonsense in Parliament as much as he likes, and you know the great the, the, his constituents will make that decision at the next election. But he really should be coming out now instead of making excuses, instead of saying he was lied to, and and he needs to probably apologise, make a public apology to, in Parliament to these people that sadly took their lives, the families of, of these victims, and the people that went to prison. There's going to be a lot of compensation cases coming down mm. the pipeline over this, Lee, and that <laughs> means a big bill. Who's going to pay that bill? Do you think? Jitsu, the software supplier, should be held accountable. Well, if they've got any sort of moral compass, um, they would be making a donation. I doubt it very much, Martin. And sadly, you know, the British taxpayer will have to stump up the bill. But I think in this case, I don't think the British taxpayer will mind that much for you know the people who've been to prison and suffered. But you know, I think they might actually. Well, <laughs> I, I think the taxpayers might be saying, "Hang on a minute, you know, you know, if the software <laughs> was supplied yeah. was not well, yeah, practice. I mean, what, what I'm saying to you, Martin, is is uh, for Jitsu, well, they won't pay. Mm. Um, and so they've got, got a lot of government contracts. Well, well, yeah, so, well, somebody, somebody's got to pay for this. I mean, yeah, maybe that's a debate to have in Parliament about the accountability for, for this firm. They've made a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and they, they made a lot of misery as well, Martin, yeah. you know, on the back of that money. So maybe you've got a fair point there. OK, want to move on to another story doing the rounds today. Of course, <laughs> as we speak, the North Sea oil and gas licence debate mm. is going on. And one of your colleagues, Chris, Chris Skidmore, has resigned over yeah. this. I wanted to um, get your take on this triggered yet another by-election. That's the last thing you do at the moment. Yeah, we don't need any more by-elections. It's a little bit sad that, some, that my colleagues resigned over this. Look, I, I don't understand his arguments. Uh, you know, we we need oil and gas. While we're making this transition to net zero in, in 2050, you know, the planet's still going to need oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, we have to make a decision in this country. Where do we get that oil and gas from? You know, are we going to be at the mercy of, of Russia again and other unstable nations, or can we get it out the the ground or from you know from out the sea right on our doorstep? I say get as much out as we can. That's a sensible thing. Not only that, Martin. I mean, it's this 200,000 jobs depend on this, and it rakes in billions and billions of pounds each mm -hmm. year for the Treasury to spend on public services. And 
Ed Miliband said, well done to Chris Skidmore. And that begs the question, if well, you've got friends listen, like Ed Miliband... Listen, you, you don't take any notice of, uh, of Ed Miliband. This is a man, when, he, when the last coal mine in this constituency closed, he was bleating on in Parliament about saving this power sta uh, saving this coal mine because it, uh, it produced coal, which then went to the power station just a few miles mm. down the road. And then we had a, when we had a debate uh, or a statement in the Parliament, I think it was last year, about opening a coal mine... Yep. In, in Cumbria, he was spouting the dispatch box saying this is a wicked thing to do. The man, the man needs to, he's got double standards, and he's a bit of an hypocrite, and he needs to make his mind look, this is British jobs and this is money to our treasury. We should get, get this oil and gas out of the ground from under the sea because any other country in the world would do this. Alok Chalmer, um, Tory MP, of course, former cabinet minister and a chair of the COP26. <sighs> yeah. he's, he's not happy about it, as you'd expect, nor is Zach Goldsmith. Does this bring us back to that question about the fact we've, we've got sort of two cons Conservative parties here, a bit like over Brexit. Uh, the net zero mob seem completely yeah. at odds with the sort of sentiment you were just I saying. Think, uh, Common sense approach. I think Alex is very passionate about the subject. Is you know the um, he's, he's been you know very outspoken on, on net zero. Um, a good colleague, but I think on on this I disagree with him. I think we have to. Look, Martin, this is a world problem, mm. this, these carbon emissions. It's a world problem. It's a world solution. It's all well and good being world leaders in this, and I would like to see us be world leaders. But in the meantime. I have people in my constituency mm. that are struggling to pay their gas bills and electric bills and they're watching every penny. It's all right for us over there, in that place there, on big salaries. Mm. You know, um, many of us live down here each week, get, get the... Uh, some, some MPs have got second homes and get the gas bills and electric bills paid for. It's all well and good. I don't have to worry if I've got enough money in my bank account each month to pay my gas and electric bill. But a lot of my constituents do, and that's my main concern. Mm. And it makes you wonder uh, if um, people have a future <sighs> career plan. I notice the Guardian <sighs> reported that um, Chris Skidmore earns, earns two hundred grand from 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 net zero jobs. Maybe it's, he's looking down the line. Separate matter. Next story: benefits Britain mm. um, in the papers today. The cost of long-term sickness <sighs> benefits is soaring, seventeen billion pounds a year yeah. expected. Long-term sick to cost us forty-eight billion quid a year by twenty thirty. Lee, how much money are we spending on? Benefits. Richie Sunak said he'd like to clamp down on it. What would you like to yeah, do? Yeah, I'd like to clamp down on it. I've been banging on about this morning since I got elected. And, uh, and before, the benefit bill in this country is massive. Uh, and there's different types of illnesses now where people are off work or, or don't want to go to work. Uh, back in the day, Martin, it was the old bad back. You used to hobble into the doctor's surgery, yeah. you know, clutching your back and uh, give me a club note for a week, week, doctor, and have a week off. But now, different illnesses. Uh, we've got it's more the mental health side of, mm. of, of things as well, where it's not always possible to diagnose correctly. Uh, I would say that um, there are a lot of genuine cases out there with with mental health problems, with anxiety problems, uh, and the like. But I'm pretty sure there's some people playing playing the system. But what we need to do, Martin, I know by speaking to employers and speaking to people in Ashfield, that if you've got mental health problems or disabilities, you're far better off in the workplace on a day-to-day -day basis, working and talking to people, that's better than being stuck at home on benefits, wasting your life. OK, I want to very quickly ask you about Sadiq Khan. Yeah. So we narrowly avoid the tube strike in London. Seems to me Sadiq Khan um, has capitulated to the unions. Is that a taste of what we might expect under a Labour government? Well, it is. I mean, I came down to London last night uh, because of the tube strikes. I, I actually drove down. Uh, and this is this is the hypocrisy of Khan. He wants to see a cleaner, cleaner atmosphere, cleaner air. I had to drive down to London last night because I thought there's going to be strikes on mm. in London. Uh, it, I don't think is certainly in my neck of the woods, Martin. is not taken serious, but in, in London it seems he seems untouchable. Uh, but he needs to get a grip because I believe that part of his manifesto when he got elected last time was no strikes. Yeah. In London, and we've seen plenty of strikes, and it's uh, to the detriment of the great people of London. Okay, superbly, Anderson. Thanks for joining us in the studio. We're going to return to our top story now, and that's this: Liberal Democrat leader Sir Ed Davey is under mounting pressure over his role in the post office scandal. Davey was postal affairs minister during the coalition government, and he's been speaking in the last few minutes. I wish I'd known then what we all know now: the post office was lying on an industrial scale to me and other ministers. And when I met uh, Alan Bates and listened to his concerns, I put those concerns to the officials in my department, to the post office, to the National Federation of Postmasters. And it's clear they all were lying to me. Why was the first Postal Affairs Minister to meet uh, Mr Bates, uh, to listen to him against the advice that I'd received because I was concerned by his letter? And I listened to him and I took his concerns and I put them to officials, I put them to the post office. 
And it's clear the post office lied to the victims, to judges, to the public, uh, to me and other postal ministers for over 20 years. This is a conspiracy by the post office to uh, deceive people. OK, Lee, well, that was Ed Davey. He's obviously not resigning. He's um, coming out with platitudes. What do you make of that? What a pathetic sight, Martin. He's, he's, he's live there on TV, snivelling, snivelling away. Look, over 700 people got convicted of these offences. Mm. You know, at any stage of that, of that investigation, a red flag should have appeared, Martin. You think that if 700 people had been convicted, somebody would say, hey, oh, there's something wrong here. Mm. Uh, and he didn't. Um, he said nothing until today, as far as I'm concerned. The man should hang his head in shame. He should, he should, uh, he should go in the chamber this afternoon and apologise. Uh, um, that's if he's here at work. Uh, it's a pathetic, it's a grovelling, nothing apology. And like I say, if he did resign, nobody would notice anyway. OK. Is that necessarily true, though? Because he has been on the warpath saying he's going to target um, swing seats, he's going to go for that kind of blue wall area yeah. in, in the home county. So he is having a bit of a dig at the Tories at the moment. Well, I mean, the, the Lib Dems, uh, they are tenacious campaigners, yeah. Martin, as you know. And when you look at some of their literature, you've seen it yeah. when you've been on the campaign trail, it's not always the most truthful of stuff they put on That's there. That's one they, way of putting it. They, they, they sail pretty close to the wind. But I think now, now one of their top dogs, if you like, has been proven to be, you know, uh, well, just not good enough for the job. He's, um, he's a, a pretty basic investigation when you've got 700 people that's been convicted in, in an organisation like the post office. Are you telling me there's 700 crooked, you know, postmasters in our, in our postal service? You know, you, you, could, you could go into any Witherspoons, um, any pub, at, uh, on a Monday, when they've done the Monday Club, when they've been on a session all day, Martin, and even at, the, at midnight, <laughs> you could talk to some of them and they'd come out with more sense than that bloke. <laughs> well, it's hard to top that. You came in to do some straight talking. That's certainly what we've got. Lee Anderson, thank you very much. Superb stuff, <laughs> as ever. <laughs> now, more than one million people have signed a petition calling for former Post Office Chief Executive Paula Venels to be stripped of her CBE. And we're going to have more on this story throughout the show. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel.
Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Sunday morning at 9.30, we're packing into 90 minutes solid, punchy politics with a bit of a twist. We not only want to inform you... But... Welcome back. It's 3.22. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Okay. Yeah, let's read on. OK, later this hour, we'll cross live to, to the East Midlands for the latest on the floods that are striking across the country. The bedlam, of course, we are facing. Tory and Labour MPs are pushing for an emergency debate on the post office scandal. And more than one million people have signed a petition calling for the former post office chief executive, Paula Vanels, to be stripped of her CBE. And over 700 post office branch managers, of course, were given criminal convictions after faulty accounting software made it appear as though money was missing from their shops, when, of course, that wasn't the case at all. And joining me now is GB News' political correspondent, Olivia Early. Olivia, a scandal that's been rolling on for many years, came to light during the coalition years, and yet it's only now been taken seriously thanks to an ITV drama. But do you think we're on the verge of these people having their names cleared, finally of getting justice and completion for those people involved? Well, as you say, just to start off, this is a scandal with very far-reaching tentacles indeed. All three of the major parties are implicated in this. It all happened under the coalition government with Lib Dem ministers uh, in charge of the post office. And actually, it started in 1999 in the last days of the Gordon Brown government. So all politicians pretty much are uh, implicated in this. And as you say, it's only really now that this ITV drama has aired that the public attention is properly onto this. Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary, is talking about various ways to try and speed up both the compensation process and the process to get those wrongful convictions overturned. There are a couple of options that he could take. One would be to mass exonerate uh, all of the postmasters who've been wrongfully convicted. At least 700 have mm. been convicted, and of those convictions, only 93 have been overturned. 54 cases actually made it to the appeal court, but either the appeal was rejected and the conviction was upheld, or the claimant just had to back out of the process because it was so complicated and so tortuous. Uh, a, a really messy situation. So there is the option of mass exoneration. David Davis is calling for that. He says, in the circumstances, although it would be radical, it's justified because the convictions were made on the grounds that only postmasters could access the IT system, thereby making them responsible, when in actual fact we now know that the system could be accessed remotely. Therefore, all those convictions are all unsafe. Another option that Alex Short could take, uh, which he's discussing with ministers at the moment, is stripping the power from the post office to uh, uh, go ahead with these private prosecutions. These 700 postmasters were convicted by the post office, and many of them say that essentially the post office acted as judge, jury and mm. executioner. Alex Short could strip that power away from the post office and hand it back to the Crown Prosecution Service. That would be a pretty radical measure too. But public outrage has reached such mm. a pitch about this that the government is now seriously considering these very dramatic measures in order to get this done and dusted once and for all and to get those 700 postmasters the justice they deserve. And this is going to be very expensive. 150 million quid already. Much more compensation cases coming down the line. I just said to Lee Anderson, who's going to pay for this? He said, well, the taxpayer. I said, well, hang on a minute. Why, why should the 
taxpayer pick up the bill. Surely the bigger question is, what about Fujitsu? If they supplied this software, if, the, if, if their fingerprints are on the safe, so to speak, and they were directly, in a sense, responsible for this, surely the, the government ha has a case to be pursuing Fujitsu for the money, bearing in mind they still have massive government contracts. Well, exactly. And those massive government contracts are coming under a lot of scrutiny now. Fujitsu is the party in all of this who seem to have avoided uh, most of the scrutiny. We're talking a lot about the individuals involved, and rightly so, Paula Venels, uh, a million signatures on a petition to strip her of her CBE. But in a way, Fujitsu is, is, is the villain in this piece, the ultimate villain in all of this piece. And yes, there is definitely an argument that the government should go to Fujitsu to, to get that money back. Another question is what happens to Ed Davey, the current leader of the Liberal Democrats, who was Post Office Affairs Minister at the time. He received five letters from Alan Bates asking for a meeting and said to Alan Bates that a meeting would serve no useful purpose. Bates also warned him that there could be an astronomical cost to the taxpayer, those were his words, if this was allowed to snowball out of control. And Davey, arguably, let it snowball out of control. Mm. So what happens to him at the end of all of this? Well, that's the big question. Thank you very much, Olivia Lee. And in fact, let's put the question now to Andrew Lua, the Conservative MP for Northampton South, who joins me live in the studio. Rishi Sunak being, being very on point here, saying this is a scandal. Strongly supports the Honours Forfeiture Committee should look into the CBE of ex-Post Office boss Paula Venels. Do you think it's the right thing? A million people now calling for her to be stripped of her honour. Well, uh, as you've just said, there's a there's a forfeiture committee that can ensure that there isn't sort of overt political influence in people losing or getting honours, certainly losing them. There has been a precedent for this with uh, Sir Fred Goodwin, as were mm. Fred, Fred Goodwin, and the interesting precedent for that is that that wasn't actually due to a criminal conviction. That was due to this bringing the honours system into disrepute issue, slightly different one than having been convicted of a, a serious crime. Um, and I understand why people are interested in Paula Venels and interested in Ed Davey and so on. They're significant issues. But I think it is these hundreds of people and their families that should be people's focus. And as has been said in GB News today, it's interesting, surprising, disappointing, all sorts of things, that it takes a television drama mm, yeah. for it to get to this pitch today. But, Andrew, Ed Davey's been very trigger-happy for, for many years, 31 times calling for the resignation of politicians and ministers. Surely, you know, in this instance, you know, he, it was on his brief, on his watch at that time, he should be getting the high jump. I think that is the issue. It's the hypocrisy that will really upset people in the country, but in the Westminster bubble as well, that if you're one of these people who every time somebody does something, they say they call for their resignation, you're the sort of person who repeatedly comes on air at every given opportunity to say, this person must resign, this is outrageous, they must go. And then... But when this is outrageous. Okay, well, and, and I was just about to say, when arguably the biggest miscarriage of justice in modern history occurs and you have a significant role in it, if you are a serial calling for people to resign type guy, yeah. that does make it much more difficult to hold on. Live by the sword, die by the sword and all of that. But on the matter of the financial situation here, 150 million quid already, Andrew, many, many more millions down the pipeline, possibly billions of pounds of, of liabilities. Lee Anderson was saying that the taxpayer will have to pick that up. The taxpayer might have something to say about that. I mean, if this is Fujitsu's error, surely the government has a beef with them. It does, but, I mean, uh, there's, there's a... There's a tension here between the desire for people to get compensation out to all of these people who've had their lives ruined by this scandal and going through a long, lengthy litigation process with a major international corporation to get money out of them, which we all know is not easy. So I think Lee's right in the sense that the taxpayer may well have to come up with it initially to give the government then time to get that back in the longer fullness of time out of Fujitsu. And how do you think that'll play with the taxpayer when I mean, the, I mean, the biscuit tin's empty? I think. I think if you are producing taxpayer money for something that people really care about and are upset about like this, it can be regarded as a priority, particularly when there must be a very, very strong chance of getting that money back, unlike most other areas of government spending, which are spent and then it's gone. This is spending to compensate people 
when they need it, which is right now because of all these ludicrous delays, and then what Fujitsu ab- in due course. What about existing contracts that Fujitsu still hold? I mean, for example, if, if I was a fish and chip shop and the person who supplied my potatoes was giving me bad potatoes, I'd terminate the contract. W- what's the difference? I think this happens time and time again. It happened with Coots as well, that it takes this sort of level of public scandal for large corporations to be held accountable for things they should be held accountable for day to day. I mean, the situation we've got where someone is being held criminally liable and imprisoned for saying they've been stealing money when it's a software error, when it's software that doesn't do what it was said to be done, I can understand why people are so annoyed about it. But I will point out that some of my parliamentary colleagues have been real heroes about this for a long time. They aren't coming on air to talk about it just today. They've been involved in this for a very long time. People like Duncan Baker, David Davis, Carl Turner, Andrew Bridgen, Lucy Allen have been standing up in Parliament, pushing on this for a very long time. Mm. And they need their due today because they're the sorts of MPs who persist and ask those difficult questions when some people would rather they didn't. That gets us to the sorts of results that we're much closer to getting now as a result of that. Thank you for joining us in the studio, Andrew. But, I mean, as you say, you know, why does it take a, a TV drama for this to be front-page news? And the deadline for, for compensation cases, I think, expires in August, so the clock is ticking. And taxpayers would like the government... I like your idea of, of a, maybe a, a bridging loan, mm. but really the book has to stop with Fujitsu, surely? I think it does, but, as I say, the public will expect these people these postmasters who've had their lives destroyed, not to be waiting even longer than they have already. OK, Andrew Lewin, thank you very much for joining us in the studio. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock. We'll discuss the controversial North Sea oil and gas bill that has already led to one Tory MP resigning. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thank you, Martin. It's 3.32. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. The Prime Minister says he'd strongly support a decision to revoke the former post office boss's CBE. Paula Venels routinely denied there were problems with the Horizon IT system, which made it look like money was missing from shops. Hundreds of staff were convicted, jailed, bankrupted and some took their lives after they were wrongly accused of theft. The Justice Secretary and Post Office Minister are now looking at how to help those who were caught up in the scandal. Former Minister Chris Skidmore has formally resigned as an MP in protest over plans to prioritise and politicise new oil and gas licences. It comes as MPs are preparing to debate the offshore petroleum bill this afternoon. If it passes, the legislation will mandate that licences for oil and gas projects in the North Sea are awarded annually. Fresh ice warnings have been issued for parts of Britain as temperatures plummet and snow and sleet showers hit the country. The Met Office has issued yellow alerts for southern England and south Wales, effective until tomorrow morning. An amber cold health alert has also been issued for parts of England, with a cold snap set to continue throughout the week. Sir Keir Starmer is visiting flood-hit areas in the East Midlands. It's after Labour accused the government of being asleep at the wheel over flood warnings. More than 160 remain in place across the country and over 1,800 properties have been damaged. And actor Idris Elba is calling for an immediate ban on machetes and so-called zombie knives. The Hollywood star spoke to the families of victims as he launched his Don't Stop Your Future campaign. Folded outfits, each representing someone who has died through knife crime, is being displayed in Parliament Square in central London. Last summer, the Home Office said tougher measures on the weapons would be introduced, but legislation hasn't yet passed. And you can get more on all those stories by visiting our website at gbnews.com. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2733 and €1.1614. The price of gold is £1,593.47 per ounce. And the FTSE 100s at 7,681 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report.
Thank you, Sophia. Now, MPs are currently voting on the controversial offshore petroleum licensing bill today. If it's passed, it will award new annual licenses for oil and gas projects in the North Sea. Of course, it's creating division in the Tory party with Chris Skidmore formally submitting his resignation as an MP in protest over plans, as he said, to prioritise and politicise new oil and gas licenses. And that has triggered a by-election in his Kingswood constituency. We're joining now to discuss this is our economics and business editor Liam Halligan with On The Money. So, Liam, a debate we have often on this show, energy sovereignty being self-reliant. The government is about to grant licences, but it's all kicking off. It is all kicking off. Chris Skidmore, of course, is one of the MPs that was heavily involved in Theresa May's original climate change bill. He actually formally signed it. Over recent years, he's made himself a pretty penny, aside from his MP salary, doing green jobs, working for various parts of the renewable energy industry, earning hundreds of thousands of pounds. I guess he wants to do a bit more of that. Nice work if you can get it. Mm. But underneath this debate in the Commons today is a really serious debate about our energy security, which will translate into the cost of energy as well as and when geopolitical pressures mount. And we've seen a lot of those geopolitical pressures in recent years, not least war between Russia and Ukraine. And now, of course, lots of uh, conflagration of turmoil across the Middle East with the heightening of the conflict between Israel and Hamas. But I think it's worth me pointing out as a, as a sort of objective economist, somebody who follows the oil and gas industry quite closely, just how important the North mm. Sea is mm. to this country, because I don't think the point is made often enough. I've got a few little factoids here up on the screen for you, Martin. It wouldn't be the same to have an on the money without a graphic, would it? <laughs> and here we see the UK oil and gas industry. There are about 300 active North Sea oil and gas fields. That's a high number. And over half of those are scheduled to cease production by 2030. Oh, but North Sea oil isn't very important. I often hear politicians say... Really? The North Sea provides 83%, Martin, of the oil and oil that we use and 54% of the gas that we use. That's for transport, heating our homes and industry. And oil and gas combined, far from being free of oil and gas, oil and gas combined provides 75% of all the UK's energy, crucially if you include transportation. That's a huge number. Mm. On top of that, Martin... Keir Starmer said that he wants to cease all new North Sea oil and gas licences. Well, guess what? The trade unions, of course, pay Labour lots of money, don't like that. The GMB, the third biggest union, they have literally thousands of members who work in the oil and gas industry. Aberdeen is, of course, the oil and gas mm -hmm. capital of Europe. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people in this country work in the oil and gas industry, either extracting oil and gas, processing, refining, distributing oil and gas. It's a massive part of our economy. And that's why, although the likes of Chris Skidmore want to demonstrate their green credentials, although, although the likes of Alex Sharma, who, of course, mm. was the cabinet minister in charge of that COP summit in Glasgow a couple of years ago now, almost in 2022, they're saying they're resigning. They're... I imagine looking for jobs in the green economy, but an awful lot of MPs will be saying, hang on, in this new realistic debate that we've got over uh, net zero and climate change, we now see that there are huge costs, and those costs, who's going to pay them? When will they be paid? You know, how much will they be? All these aspects of net zero, all these aspects of getting a cleaner environment, which, of course, we all want, are now coming to the fore and not a moment too soon. And in terms of the cost, I mean, it just seems insane that we're importing like 14 billion quid's worth of gas per year, and Keir Starmer's energy policy seems to be just stop oil. Well, not only do imported oil and gas... Uh, uh, reliance on imported oil and gas, it raises energy security issues, it raises price issues, of course, but it also raises net zero issues. How so? Well, because if you rely on what we call LNG, liquefied natural gas mm. from America, which we have been increasingly, that involves huge 
carbon emissions. Mm. Why? Because you need an awful lot of energy to get the gas in America and turn it into a liquid, and then it's put on a ship, and then that ship goes 3,000 miles across the Atlantic in a diesel-powered container ship, and then it has to be regasified here in the UK, uh, either for our use or export to Europe. And again, that regasification uses up a lot of energy. You know, credible scientists have said that liquefied natural gas from America involves five times more carbon emissions if used in the UK than using our own North Sea oil and gas. Mm. So if you, if you accept that we need oil and gas, and even the Climate Change Commission, the government's own internal green watchdog, if you like, even they acknowledge that by 2050 we'll still be using oil and gas for 25-30% mm. of our energy needs under the best-case scenario for the rollout of renewables. If we need that oil and gas, then it makes sense financially, in terms of carbon emissions, and in terms of energy security, the oil and gas industry would say, to use our own. And I think an awful lot of politicians, while they don't want to be seen as sort of antediluvian or dinosaurs when it comes to this green debate, these realities are now coming to the fore, which is why this vote in the Commons, I think, will be close. Great stuff, Liam Halligan. Always a pleasure with On The Money. OK, let's bring you some breaking news now. The Royal Navy is deploying a third warship to the Gulf region amid growing tensions and attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. In a statement to Parliament, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps confirmed that the Type 23 frigate HMS Richmond will join two other Royal Navy vessels on policing duties in the region. HMS Lancaster, another Type 23 frigate, and the Type 45 destroyer HMS Diamond are currently protecting shipping in the busy waters around the Red Sea following regular attacks by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. Now, it's National Divorce Day. Yippee! Would you believe that more people split up today than on any other day of the year? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Earlier with Eamon and Isabel. Three, two, one, launch. I wouldn't mind a banana night. Oh, I like banana yeah, and toast. Yeah, 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 that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you like banana and toast? I love banana with a touch of cinnamon as well. No, you have to spoil it. <laughs> you have to spoil it. <laughs> Marriages. More of them are breaking down and they break down today. This day, this first working day of January, than other times of the year. A large number of people, irrespective of the cost of living crisis, which is hugely florid at the moment, who will just simply say, emotionally, this is too much of a toll for me to take. Every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Welcome back. It's 3.46. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News, live from Westminster. Now, at 4 o'clock, I'll discuss Sadiq Khan bowing to pressure from unions and ask, is this what life would look like under a Labour government? Now, a cold weather alert has been issued by the UK Health Security Agency, while the Met Office has put out yet another yellow weather warning, with snow showers set to hit parts of the country. Some areas of the southeast have already seen snow today, while some parts of the country are underwater following Storm Henk last week. Well, joining me now from Loughborough is GB News' East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis. Will, thanks for joining us. It never rains, but it pours. What's the latest from Loughborough? Yes, well, the good news is that there is only one flood alert in place now here in Loughborough, here in the East Midlands. But this was one of the places that was devastated by floods after Storm Henk. And this was actually one of the places that the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, visited. He was actually along this canal earlier today. You can see that the canal level is quite steadily falling, certainly from where it was only a few days ago. And some of the people that saw how bad the flooding got here in Loughborough was Caroline and Stacey, who are from the boat in the local pub here. You were here when it started to flood in this part of uh, the, the Leicestershire County. You didn't flood, but you were here when it was. What was it like? Well, I was awoken like early hours of the morning to the chap on the boat because the boat was on the towpath. So I came down, switched the lights on, and it was just absolute manic. There was panic everywhere. The, the water had risen under the bridge, as you've just seen. That was, you couldn't see the canal for the path. And it sort of like stopped just up there. And then obviously the boat was here. We had to get that back in because it's on its side. So we pushed, there's a few of us pushed that back in. Then just down there, if you can see the sandbags, there's um, a little cut, we call the cut. And it was absolutely pouring through there. And it was taking me off my feet. So I was trying to get people out, rescue people, get them to safety here. I was ringing a bell and shouting, you know, that we're open. And it was about 100 homes that flooded here, about 300 in Leicestershire, about, I think it's 2,000 uh, across England. But we've seen the Labour leader here today, and, and he actually came in and spoke to you. What, what did you hear from Sir Keir Starmer today? He was horrified. I don't think he could believe how much damage it had actually caused and the amount of people that were out of their homes, that, like he said, the people without insurance. So, you know, they've not just lost everything. They can't even replace it because they've got no insurance. He was talking about a, a flood prevention plan rather than just reacting to floods. Were you happy to see the Labour leader or is it a politician is the last person you want to see in a community that's been flooded? Or, or do you want to see politicians at a time of emergency? Um, I was quite shocked, to be fair, that he was actually coming. I didn't think he would come himself. So, yeah, it just shows that there's a lot of support 
from the MPs. So, yeah, I was quite pleased to see him. Good to see the politicians. Um, part of it now, Stacey, is the response from helping people that have been affected. Just tell me a little bit about what you've been doing for the community. So on Wednesday, after all the homes have been flooded and everybody realised it was all flooded, we went um, basically around to see what everybody needed and everything. So me and my sister decided to go and do a shop so we had at least 10 of everything so we could do food parcels. And then most of the community came down, started donating clothes, blankets, quilts, food, toiletries, cleaning products, everything. And we also had the Red Cross come down to help uh, with like mop buckets, uh, sweeping brushes. Uh, we had the Salvation Army come and help as well. So we had lots of help from all the community all around. Yeah, it seems that this is a real uh, show that you need a pub, you need a, a local place for people to come to, not just for a drink, not just time to, to socialise, but actually um, a place to come in emergency as well, Martin. Thank you, Hollis, and good luck to all at the Boat Inn. Now, more marriages break down in January than at any other time of the year, so much so that the first working Monday in January is often dubbed National Divorce Day. Throughout January, over 40,500 people in the UK are expected to search online for divorce, a near 25% increase. GB News' London reporter Lisa Hartle explains more. January is usually the busiest time for divorce lawyers as people reflect on their lives and consider what changes they want to make. But due to the cost of living crisis, this year could be different. Well, traditionally, uh, Monday is described as divorce day because it's seen a huge spike in referrals to divorce lawyers as people have spent arguably extended periods of time with their loved ones over the Christmas period, so much so that they have ceased to be their loved ones and they have probably decided, actually, I can take no more Christmases with this person. Neil Russell, a family law solicitor, says they get the most divorce inquiries in January, but financial pressures mean some people are delaying proceedings. And what with the growing utility costs, which are burdening families on their own, two lots of those utility costs are even more difficult to manage. The other factors, a big factor, are mortgages. Uh, they want out of their marriage, but sadly the finances do not always permit for them to do so. The other thing that we've noticed nowadays where people can't necessarily afford to get divorced that is a nesting arrangement whereby the parents take it in terms of, say, renting a cheaper property where they share the occupation of for two or three days a week so the kids don't have to move, but the parents move in and out. Research from Legal and General has found more than 270,000 couples have delayed splitting due to financial pressures. One in five, 19% of our sample of recent divorces were delayed due to financial reasons. So, you know, the kind of common financial worries around the cost of divorce proceedings, but also about what will happen to their income as a result. And so much uncertainty in market around the economic conditions and whether or not people will even have jobs going forward. But psychologist Lucy Beresford says that she finds this research doesn't match her experience with clients. We've actually had other moments in time where you would have thought things might have compromised people's ability to get a divorce. We had had the financial crisis in 2009-10. We had a housing crisis. So people found it harder to move house and create two households. We also had the pandemic where people couldn't leave their house. And yet divorces still happened. And I suspect that what's going to happen is that Actually, there will still be a large number of people, irrespective of the cost of living crisis, which is hugely florid at the moment, who will just simply say, emotionally, this is too much of a toll for me to take. With the financial situation still so difficult for so many, it could be some time yet before unhappy couples finally get the divorce they want. Lisa Hartle, GB News, London. Now, there's a lot of pressure on people to have perfect happy marriages. Unfortunately, the world isn't a perfect happy place. And if you break up and you're happy, why not do it? Now, the Lib Dem leader, Ed Davey, says the post office lied to him when the scandal was first brought to his post's attention. I'm Martin Dorby on GB News, Britain's news channel. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Hello, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Turning frosty again tonight and particularly in the south, it could be icy. We do have a few snow flurries, no huge amounts, but some places seeing a bit of snow come in, parts of the Midlands, southern England, working into South Wales and the southwest. So wherever we see any of those, it could turn icy with temperatures at or around freezing. Some stubborn fog patches over northern Scotland. They may well thicken up overnight. Most towns and cities dipping down close to freezing. Some on the east coast may just stay above, but for most, a frosty start to Tuesday. That fog in northern Scotland, particularly along the uh, Murray Firth towards uh, uh, Inverness, may well stick around again for most of Tuesday. Elsewhere, there'll be patchy clouds, but some hopeful little tend to break up over South Wales and southwest England. It may stay fairly cloudy in parts of eastern England and southeast Scotland, but for most, it'll brighten up some winter sunshine, but don't expect it to be warm. It's a cold one. Temperatures in the south, three, four degrees. And on that wind, it will feel even colder. Frost returns as we go through tomorrow night and into Wednesday. Wednesday sees a bit more cloud across the northeast of England and eastern Scotland. Could be a few showers here. Here they'll chiefly be of rain, however. In the south, most places dry and sunny, but with that cold breeze yet again. Once more, the west coast of Scotland having a fine day with plenty of sunshine. Temperatures creeping up, but it's still going to be cold. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's The Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 4pm yeah, yeah, and welcome yeah. to Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster and all across the UK. Coming up, as Sadiq Khan crumbles under pressure from the unions to stop a tube strike, I'll ask, is this a taste of things to come under a future Labour government? And with much of the country underwater, Sir Keir Starmer has said the government's response to flooding is not good enough. But would you even welcome an MP in wellies to your flood site? And we'll cross live to Farnborough, where the Home Office is set to house around 300 asylum seekers in luxury flats. We'll speak to Jez, a concerned local, who tells us why he thinks this is completely the wrong location. And as usual, I want to hear from you. All the usual ways, email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. We've got lots more to come this hour, including Labour. The strike is off under Sadiq Khan, but is that a taste of things to come? And the latest, of course, on all of the floods in a few minutes' time. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good afternoon to you. Well, the top story today from the GB Newsroom is that the Prime Minister says he'd strongly support a decision to revoke the former post office boss's CBE. Paula Venels routinely denied there were problems with the Horizon IT system, which made it look like money was missing from post office branches. Hundreds of staff, as a result, were convicted, jailed, bankrupted and some even took their own lives after they were wrongly accused of theft. The Justice Secretary and Post Office Minister are now looking at how to help those caught up in the scandal. One of the victims, Christopher Head, says he doesn't believe the fault lies with just one person. You roll back over the years that, you know, there is obviously people in Fujitsu, there is people in government or ministers or even, you know, civil servants that maybe try to have damage limitation, let's say, in order to try and make this a hope that it will go away. So there's there's countless number of people. So you had previous CEOs at post office of Adam Crozier. There's, you know, there's just, there's, the list is endless. So we, we need the inquiry to finish so we get to the bottom of that and obviously for the, the Met Police to do their investigation. Christopher Head. Well, the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Bim Afalami, says the government is working as quickly as it can to compensate the victims. It's worth saying that everybody involved with the post office horizon scandal, 100% of them have received interim payments of over £168,000. That isn't enough, that that's an interim payment. We've brought forward a bill going through Parliament, should clear Parliament in the next week or so, so that we don't have to wait for the results of the inquiry, so that we can get this compensation paid in full as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Labour MP Kevin Jones is pushing for emergency legislation to exonerate the victims completely. It's what I've come to expect over the years uh, from the post office. It's been lies and cover-ups all along. Uh, but the key point is we've got to get these convictions overturned because they're quite clearly unsafe. And the Liberal Democrats' leader, Sir Ed Davey, who was a postal affairs minister at the time, denies any wrongdoing. I wish I'd known then what we all know now. The post office was lying on an industrial scale to me and other ministers. And when I met uh, Alan Bates and listened to his concerns, I put those concerns to the officials in my department, to the post office, to the National Federation of Postmasters. And it's clear... They all were lying to me. It's Ed Davey. Well, in other news today, Chris Skidmore has formally resigned as an MP, triggering another by-election. The government's former net zero czar quit in protest over what he says are plans to prioritise and politicise new oil and gas licences. That's as MPs prepare to debate the offshore petroleum bill this afternoon. If it passes, the legislation will mandate that licences for oil and gas projects in the North Sea are awarded annually. 
Another warship is being deployed to the Gulf region by the Royal Navy amid growing tensions and attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps confirming HMS Richmond will join two other Royal Navy vessels on policing duties in the region. Multiple attacks have been launched towards commercial shipping in the region, with Houthi rebels claiming the attacks are aimed at vessels linked to Israel. Here at home, fresh ice warnings have been issued for parts of Britain as temperatures plummet and snow and sleet showers hit the country. The Met Office has in fact issued yellow alerts for southern England and southern Wales, effective until tomorrow morning. An amber cold health alert has also been issued for parts of England, with the cold snap set to continue throughout the week. And Sir Keir Starmer has visited flood-hit East Midlands regions today, promising that a Labour government would do more to protect people's homes. It's after Labour accused the government of being asleep at the wheel over flood warnings. More than 160 remain in place across the country and over 1,800 properties have been damaged. This isn't the first time I've been out to talk to residents in this situation. I've got to get ahead of this. And that means earlier in the year, in the autumn, having a task force that brings together local authorities, the emergency response, local people, to ensure that the prevention work is done. Some of the drains that are now being cleaned could have been cleaned beforehand. The response wasn't quick enough. So I just don't think it's good enough for the government to come after the event again and express empathy, get ahead of this with a task force. That's what I would do. It's Keir Starmer. Now, the actor Idris Elba is calling for an immediate ban of machetes and so-called zombie knives. The Hollywood actor spoke to the families of victims as he launched his Don't Stop Your Future campaign. Folded outfits, each one representing someone who's died through knife crime, are being displayed in Parliament Square in central London today. And Idris Elba saying, although deterrents like stop and search powers are working to some degree, much more needs to be done. It makes me feel sad as a society that we aren't putting as much focus as we should be on, on, on stopping this, OK? And I just, I think today's campaign launch is about just re-energising re, um, uh, the government to think about this, re-energising our society to think about this as a group and say, all right, how can we stop this? Idris Elba. Now, a private lunar lander launched from the United States this morning has suffered what... Uh, they're calling a technical problem. The issue has prevented it from pointing its solar panels, apparently, with some stability at the sun. Without the ability to charge its batteries and maintain a power supply, the mission won't be able to continue. Experts are trying to resolve the issue. The Peregrine Mission 1, as it's known, is aiming to become the first US spacecraft to make a soft landing on the moon in half a century. It was expected to land on February the 23rd. That's the news on GB News, across the UK, on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. Thank you, Polly. Now, we start this hour with a massive climb down by Sadiq Khan that could just be a taste of things to come under a future Labour government. The Mayor of London has, has made more money available for tube workers, causing RMT General Secretary Mick Lynch to call off a strike that would have been brought the network to a standstill this week from today, in fact. RMT members were due to walk out from today until the end of the week in protest at an inflation-busting 5% pay offer. But this morning, former Downing Street Chief of Staff Nick Timothy warned that a Labour government would do huge damage to the nation's finances. Well, I'm joined now by our political correspondent, Olivia Utley. So, on the one hand, Olivia, um, Khan would have been damned if he did, damned if he didn't. He said there'd be no strikes under him as London Mayor. There'd been a shed load of strikes. This one was narrowly avoided. People are saying, was it because he's bowing to his union paymasters? Well, this is always going to be a problem for Labour politicians in positions of power. The Labour Party is interlinked with the union movement and uh, Sadiq Khan may well have found himself under pressure from the unions to give in to that pay demand from tube drivers. 
On the other hand, I mean, you could argue that Labour has a better relationship with the unions than the Conservatives, and there are those who think that were Keir Starmer in power, we would have seen fewer strikes over the last 18 months than we've seen under the Conservatives. That article you mentioned by Nick Timothy, former yeah. Downing Street advisor and Telegraph columnist now in The Telegraph this morning, is, is very interesting indeed. He points to uh, some of the promises made by Rachel Reeves, the, the shadow chancellor. She she says that under Labour, and Keir Starmer repeats this message a lot, uh, we would be we would be a, have a tighter fiscal rules and the economy would be kept in check. She wants to reduce debt as a uh, proportion of GDP uh, and she wants to see day-to-day uh, -day spending not funded by borrowing. Nick Timothy points out that that's all very well, but actually Labour could well find their own loopholes around that. Gordon Brown too promised not to use debt, uh, not to use uh, borrowing to fund day-to-day -day spending. But he found an enormous loophole by essentially reclassifying a lot of day-to-day -day spending as investment and then using borrowing to fund that. And of course, Labour has made a lot of promises, a lot of very, very expensive promises. Huge plans on education to uh, roll out far more uh, early years places in nursery schools attached to primary schools for pretty much all children between nine months and four years. Huge plans uh, on the environment. They want to launch this new green economy. They've promised hundreds and hundreds, thousands of jobs as a result of this new green economy. All of these things are very expensive indeed. And at the moment, their plan to fund it seems to be by uh, cutting the VAT exemption for private schools. Nice idea, you might think, but how many times over has that money been promised to different causes? So Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer are going to struggle to stick to the rules that they've set themselves on national debt mm. and on uh, borrowing for day-to-day -day spending. Nick Timothy thinks that it can't be done. You might say he would say that. He was Theresa May's advisor. He's standing to be a Labour MP. But it's an interesting question and one which I think we're going to hear a lot more about in the coming months as Labour gets closer and closer to government. And indeed, Nick Timothy says the trouble with Labour governments, to paraphrase Margaret Thatcher, is that they eventually run out of other people's money. And he points to the fact that that's precisely what happened to Labour governments in 51, 1970, 79 and 2010. However... The biscuit tin's pretty empty now under a Tory government. <laughs> well, well, I see where you're coming from, and I think that that's, that's an argument we'll see Keir Starmer making a lot too. Yes, he's made a lot of very expensive promises, but you could say, could things get much worse economically in Britain? Under the Conservatives, we now have the highest tax burden in 70 years since World War II, and Keir Starmer argues that because of his good relationships with business, because of his sort of core Bush's Blairite approach uh, to the economy, we would actually be better off under a Labour government than a Conservative government. And he basically believes that if he keeps saying that message, it's very hard for people to point to aspects of their life where they are financially better off than they were 13 years ago, which kind of undermines the Conservative case for being the, the party of sound money. Indeed does. Olivia Lee, thank you very much for joining us in the studio. And to take this debate a stage further, I'm now joined by former Labour MP Stephen Pound. Stephen, thank you for joining us on the show. My Always pleasure. a pleasure. Stephen, of course, Nick Timothy would say the problem with Labour is that they, they eventually run out of other the people's money, but it does seem a little bit suspect, don't you think, that um, a last-minute strike was averted by Sadiq Khan doing a deal with the RMT. Is this a taste of what's to come yeah. under a potential future Labour government bowing to endless strikes, having to cough up loads of money to dodge them? <laughs> well, no, you, you simply couldn't get away with that. There's no way that you could conduct industrial relations by uh, you know, just, just you know, putting, putting more and more uh, money on the table. It just simply doesn't work that way. Look, uh, the reality is, when, when we hear people, I mean, Olivia is normally does a very, very good analysis on these matters, but the reality is that the uh, early years money is going, is going to come from the, removing the VAT from the commercial sector in education. And as for the green taxing, the 38 
billion. That was announced two years ago before trust trashed the economy. Quite frankly, you can't operate economics today on what happened, you know, uh, without, without, without recognizing what happened a few, few days ago. But look, getting back to this, we don't know what the terms of the deal are. If Sadiq Khan can actually do a deal with the RMT and ultimately Aslev, because Aslev obviously will be champing at the bit now, will he do a deal maybe to actually reduce some, some yeah, lessening staffing levels, to increase flexibility? Things. If there's something in it for the commuters of London, then I think fair play to him. But most people I've spoken to today, travelling on the tube today, are just so glad that the tube strike is off because this is the first day they're back at school. Many people have just come back to work. It would have been a disaster if we'd had an underground strike today. So at the moment, I think Sadek's doing what he should do as Mayor of London, is keeping London moving. Yeah, but keeping London moving comes at a price if there's a 5% pay offer which mm. has to be funded, presumably mm. out of central London, the mayor's pot. And isn't that the problem moving forward? Mm. If the Labour Party are elected, mm. you'd have the... You have the junior doctors queuing up, NHS workers, teachers. Everybody in the public sector will demand a slice of that pie. And the fact of the matter is, where Nick Timothy is half right is that the Labour Party might run out of other people's money, but the Conservative Party have completely run out of other people's money. We're £2.6 <laughs> yeah. trillion pounds mm. in debt, mm. Stephen. Mm. So the spectre of the 1970s-style strikes coming back under Labour with no public money to fund it mm -hmm. is terrifying people. Well, it shouldn't terrify people. I mean, what's happening is that people are trying to build this up as a straw man. Uh, because in, in, in all honesty, you know and I know, Martin, you've been elected, you know, I've been elected... You, there's demands on you morning, noon and night, and you can't meet them, or we all know that. But look, let's get one thing absolutely straight. When people say the biscuit tin is empty, there's no money, just look at HMS Westminster, which the government have just spent billions actually upgrading, and now they're mothballing it. There is a fantastic waste of money in Parliament at the present time. Why are we not collecting more tax from the non-DOMs? Why are we not actually enforcing uh, regulations against people who are dodging paying tax? There's, you know, when you estimate the, the percentage of the tax take, which is dodged by people who can afford to pay for it, extremely expensive accountants. Bring that into mind. Bring the MOD into account. Bring all those things into account. And then I think we're in a much, much more rosy situation. Now, I'm not saying that every single person knock it on the door. I think, in all honesty, the junior doctors wanting 35%. I mean, if they got 35%, they'd be paying more in tax because they'd get dragged into the higher tax band. They'd suffer from what you, know, what you described as fiscal drag. Mm. So I don't think there's any question about that. But look, as far as I'm concerned, let's see the devil in the detail with Sadek, what he's done with Mick Lynch, what he's done and what he's going to obviously do with Aslev. But if, if he's managed to get some more flexibility in the working, managed to get improved working times, maybe even, you know, Sunday working on, on a rostered basis, then if he's done that on a Sunday basis, all well and good. I'm prepared to support that, and I think that's a sensible thing for a Mayor of London, who's not just the Mayor of London, but he's head of TfL Transport for London as well. If he's done that, then I'll support him for that. But don't you think a lot of people are quite rightly afraid of the fact that, you know, strikes could paralyse the nation mm. if there's no money to pay them? And how would the Labour Party... We're moving into kind of different territory now. People don't remember the old days of the 70s and the 80s. I do. Mm. And it was a period where, where the, the nation just ground to a halt. <laughs> and without that money... I mean, that, that note that was left by Liam Byrne to mm. David Cameron, I'm sorry, there's no money left, that was like a, a frugal £97 billion in debt. Now a 2.6 trillion. The fear is increased strike demands, no money to pay it, taxation might force people to clear off out the country, and we're heading back to the future, the bad old days of the 70s. Well, two things so I can say to that. Every single financial secretary to the Treasurer since Reginald Maudling in 1964 has left a message like that to his successor. Reginald Maudling's message in 1964 was, sorry old, well, he used a, a, a colloquial expression, he left a bottle of champagne, he said there's no cash left. Every single chance of the Exchequer, and it's always it's been Labour, Tory, Labour, Tory. It wasn't until David Laws came into post in 2010, a Liberal, that he took a look and he actually thought that this was a serious note. So let's park that. Liam Byrne was just doing what every single, Anthony Barber, Roy Jenkins, every other Chancellor of the Exchequer had done. But look, the, 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 the key thing here is, in, in all honesty, you're talking about going back to, you know, in place of strife, you're going back to the winter of discontent. That was the 70s and the 80s. Look at the Labour government between 1997 and 2010. We lost more, oh, sorry, we had more working 
working days and less strike days than any other government since the war. We managed to actually negotiate and keep the country running. And we didn't do it by, in Nye, Nye Bevan's expression, choking their mouths with gold. We did it by sensible, serious negotiation and talking about terms and conditions of service. So just don't judge us by what we say. Judge us by what we did. And in 1997 to 2010, just look at the number of strike days that were lost. They're less than they are, a great deal less than they are at the present time. OK, well, let's hope you're being optimistic for good reason there. Thank you very much, Stephen Pound, <laughs> for even joining us. For <laughs> well, uh, he's still going. Well, earlier I spoke to Conservative Par Deputy Party Chairman Lee Anderson about the suspension of the tube strikes, and let's hear his view. This is the hypocrisy of Con. He wants to see a cleaner, cleaner atmosphere, cleaner air. I had to drive down to London last night because I thought there was going to be strikes on mm. in London. Uh, it, I don't think is certainly in my neck of the woods, Martin, is not taken serious. But it, in London, it seemed he seemed untouchable. Uh, but he needs to get a grip because I believe that part of his manifesto when he got elected last time was no strikes. Yeah. In London, and we've seen plenty of strikes, and it's uh, to the detriment of the great people of London. There we have it. Well, spending on disability benefits is set to rise by £17 billion a year by 2030. Now, in my view, that is simply unacceptable and unaffordable. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Put your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, oh. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. It's 4.23. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later this hour, we'll discuss the Home Office's decision to use a luxury block of flats in Hampshire in Farnborough to house around 300 migrants. I spoke to two locals earlier on, and I spoke to the councillor, the leader of the, of the council, on Friday. Locals were not consorted. They're absolutely disgusted um, that this accommodation has been given away, and locals can't afford to get on the property ladder in fact, they're moving out of the area altogether. And I'll have some choice words from Jazz, a local, coming up soon. But moving on now. Spending on disability benefits is set to rise by an astonishing £17 billion a year by 2030. And that's according to official forecasts. The number of people claiming for such benefits has more than doubled since the pandemic, with mental health issues including anxiety and depression said to be the leading causes. Well, joining me now to discuss this is our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Liam. OK, Liam, so here we go. This is something that we've, we've seen coming for a long time. The budget has more than doubled since the pandemic. A lot of people are thinking sick note Britain is taking hold, costing a heck of a lot of money. An extra 17 billion quid a year, mental health being cited. A lot of people saying mental health is the new bad back. Whatever the reason is, this is unsustainable and unaffordable. So what we've got, we've got newspaper reports of internal forecasts from the Department for Work and Pensions. Now, you know, I wouldn't be the journalist I, it, I am if I didn't remark that often Whitehall forecasts get leaked to newspapers in order tr to try and influence budget outcomes yes. so particular departments get more money. But no one is saying that what the Department of Work and Pension forecasts are pointing to isn't a real issue. And the real issue is because we've got an ageing population, because there's a lot more emphasis on mental health, the amount of money we're going to spend on disability benefit mm. is going to go up a huge amount. It's going to go up by about 50% between now and 2030, according to the DWP. That's from £31 billion a year up to £48 billion a year, which is sort of getting on for what we spend mm. on defence, believe it or not. Mm. 5.5 million people currently claim sickness and disability benefit, Martin. That's going to go up by 2030, according to these Department of Work and Pension internal forecasts, which somehow saw the light of day, to 7.6 million People. That will be getting on for one in nine of the total population, not just people of working age. Crazy. And, and it's also highlighting a chronic job vacancies issue, because, of course, people are often finding now it pays more to not work. So long-term sick, as opposed to doing what they would call work that's beneath them, we have this terrible dilemma of a huge fiscal bill for benefits and we're unable to get those jobs done, and therefore the calls for, well, more migration to solve the problem. This is one of the long-term implications of the pandemic. Look, when you shut down the economy for 18 months, it has long-term implications. It has long-term implications on people's health because they didn't go to the NHS because they were told not to, so mm. they've ended up with terminal cancer. Mm. It has long-term implications on children who didn't go to school and they lost that one or two school years. And students, by the way, who didn't get to go to university when they thought they would. Lots and lots of implications. And a big implication is on the world of work. Working from home is with us. It's never going to Change. Now, in some senses, that's a good thing. If you can work from home, if you've got a desk-bound job, if you can use Wi-Fi, there's some efficiencies there, as long as you don't work from home all the time. Mm. I'm not saying there aren't efficiencies. But also, there's been a big impact on mental health, people claiming that they're not fit for work, getting signed off, uh, are sick by doctors. It would take a pretty hard-hearted doctor, many would say, to not give people a sick note for mental health when they say that they've got mental health Conditions And, of course, employers are worried about employees mm. becoming litigious and trying to sue for ignoring mental health issues. So this really is becoming a major part of society. And these numbers out from the DWP, and as I say, quite often Whitehall forecasts get leaked for political reasons. I'm not saying that's happening in this case. I don't know. Uh, but we are, of course, coming up to a budget settlement. Uh, the, the day of the budget, the spring statement was announced over the Christmas holiday. It's going to be March the 6th. And, you know, a week later, you get these forecasts from the Department of Work and Pensions saying that spending on sickness and disability benefit is going to go up by 50% in real terms 
between now and 2030. As I say, from £31 billion mm -hmm. a year to £48 billion a year, one in nine of the population by then, according to the department, will be claiming sickness or disability benefit. And those are astonishing statistics, Liam. Do you think there's also some, some political sabre-rattling going on here? Because this will allow the Conservatives to suddenly talk tough on clamping down on benefits. These eye-watering numbers, £48 billion every single year. Um, this can't go on, and the Tories, traditionally, they're the ones who clamp down on this, and the Labour Party are forced to defend it. Hey, there's an election come in, the Labour Party is going to bankrupt us. Well, certainly the, the fact that the numbers are out there, whether they were leaked by civil servants or mm. ministers or shadow ministers who sometimes are able in our system to access these internal forecasts, particularly at the moment when Labour is, quote, preparing for government. The civil service were in a phase where they have to be open with Labour because Labour could easily be the next government. That's right and proper. That's, that's mm. the convention of how we run our country and our government more specifically. But whoever's leaking it for whatever reason, it certainly ups the ante. Here are you and I on GB News talking about what mm. is quite a nerdy subject. No doubt the newspapers will be picking up on this. Suddenly, this is a major bone of contention. £48 billion is real money. Mm. For us to be spending £48 billion a year on sickness and disability benefit, a 50% increase in just five or six years is a major concern. So I do think it's right and proper that we discuss these issues because these are huge amounts of public money. And in the end, you know, governments don't have money. The only money they have mm. is money that businesses and workers pay in taxation. Mm. So I do think this is going to up the ante. You're right, though, it could go either way politically. We'll see in the run-up to the election the extent to which sickness and disability benefit, this broader working from home debate, how much of a contentious political issue it will become. We know that the Labour Party, they haven't got a manifesto yet, but we know they want to give mm. workers more rights to work from home, making it harder for businesses to push back to require their employees to come in. Many business owners, on the other hand, will, will be saying, if I pay you, it's my right to mm. ask you, yeah, would you mind coming in to work for the money <laughs> that I give you? You know, these are issues that, you know, just a generation ago, just five years ago, would have been seen completely pie in the sky. Mm. Whether or not you actually have to turn up to work, Martin, it's now mainstream politics. OK, Liam Halligan, thank you very much for that update. And let's bring you some sad breaking news now, and that's that football legend Franz Beckenbauer has sadly died at the age of 78. Beckenbauer was the West Germany captain when they won the World Cup in 1974, and he was the West Germany coach when they won the 1990 World Cup as well. And of course, they beat England on penalties on the way to winning that tournament, the Kaiser. Well, there's lots more still to come now. Between now and five o'clock, we'll have the latest on the floods that have hit large parts of the country. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The headlines this hour. The Prime Minister says he'd strongly support a decision to revoke the former post office boss's CBE. Paula Venels routinely denied there were problems with the Horizon IT system, which made it look like money was missing from branches. Hundreds of post office staff were therefore convicted, jailed, bankrupt. Some even took their own lives after they were wrongly accused of theft. The Justice Secretary and Post Office Minister are now looking at how to help those caught up in the scandal. Former Minister Chris Skidmore has formally resigned as an MP in protest over plans to prioritise and politicise new oil and gas licences. That comes as MPs are preparing to debate the offshore petroleum bill this evening. If it passes, the legislation will mandate that licences for oil and gas projects in the North Sea are awarded annually. And fresh ice warnings have been issued for parts of Britain as temperatures plummet, sleet and snow showers have hit much of the south of the UK, the Met Office, issuing a yellow alert for southern England and Wales effective until tomorrow morning. An amber cold health alert has also been issued for parts of England, according to the government's warning system. With cold weather expected to impact health services, much of Kent is already covered. And Sir Keir Starmer is visiting flood-hit areas of the East Midlands after Labour accused the government of being asleep at the wheel over flood warnings. More than 160 remain in place across the country and over 1,800 properties have been damaged. 
The actor Idris Elba is calling for an immediate ban of machetes and so-called zombie knives. The Hollywood actor spoke to the families of victims as he launched his Don't Stop Your Future campaign. Folded clothes, each representing someone who died because of knife crime, are being displayed in Parliament's uh, square today in central London. Last summer, the Home Office said tougher measures on weapons would be introduced, but legislation hasn't yet passed. Those are the headlines. More detail on all those stories by heading to our website, gbnews.com. Thank you, Polly. Now, a cold weather alert has been issued by the UK Health Security Agency. Well, the Met Office has issued yet another yellow weather warning with snow showers set to hit parts of the country. Some areas of the southeast have already seen snow today, while some parts of the country are under water following Storm Henk last week. Well, joining me now from Loughborough is GB News' East Midlands reporter, Will Hollis. Will, what's the latest out there from Loughborough? Yes, well, it's the last thing you would want if you've been flooded because of Storm Henk. Now, terribly bad weather. We've heard from the UK Health Security Agency that there's an amber health alert for cold weather. That means people that are particularly vulnerable really do need to take care. But if you've already been affected, like the 300 or so homes here in Leicestershire, that's where you're going to find a little bit more trouble. Just to recap you on what we were talking about earlier, here the canal was completely completely flooded. This particular narrowboat ended up on its side here along the, the side of the canal here in Loughborough. Um, but there's now a bit of a community response from the boat in, which is the pub here, uh, which we can just go inside now. And people have been coming here because they've lost everything. They've lost their beds, they've lost their uh, cooking equipment, they've lost all their electrical items. And now the local people who uh, are from the local pub have been gathering things from the local community, including Stacey. Stacey, it was actually you that came up with the idea to help local people. Um, what's this flood been like for people in Loughborough? It's been absolutely devastating for most people. They've literally lost everything. Like, they've, most people, all they've got, especially from the flats, is things that were high up, like their kettles, their toasters, that sort of thing. Everything else, like their sofa, clothes, shoes, everything is gone. We're talking about the cold weather now because after the water's gone, the cold weather's come in. What's that going to mean for people that have been flooded and, and have potentially lost most of their items, the cold weather coming in now? Well, as you see, obviously, we've collected a lot of stuff over here. That's all, like, bedding, uh, blankets, uh, pillows, that sort of stuff. So there's plenty of stuff, So obviously, like, for the community. So if they need anything, it's all here. So just to keep them warm if they need it. It's been a busy day. You've had the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, visiting today, and you actually spoke to him. What was it that he wanted to talk to you guys about? Well, he said to me, I hear that you helped with, obviously, gathering things from the community. And obviously, I was like, yes. Um, and he says he's really happy to see how the communities come together to help each other. But that's what it's all about, to help each other when everybody needs it. Were you happy to see Keir Starmer here today? And um, were you happy with the kind of things that he talked about? One of the things he's been saying to the media is that we should have flood prevention strategies in place much earlier to help communities like Loughborough. Yeah, yes, I agree. Um, obviously, especially where it flooded, like Belton Road and everything, those drains were horrible and they didn't get cleared out until it was flooded. And obviously that was too late. So hopefully it doesn't happen again. You've never seen those drains be cleaned before by whether it's a local council or a uh, local uh, water service? I've never seen them being cleaned myself, no. So. Um, what happens now? Because these things eventually, they, they start to move away from, from the TV just as, as news goes on. What happens now for, for you and the people that have been affected in Loughborough and other places across the East Midlands and the country? Well, as long as it goes on, we'll always be here to support everybody around in the community. So if they need somewhere to come, we're here. If they need anything, we can point them in the same direction. So we're just here to help everybody. Serving not just pints, but serving the local community as well. Stacey, thanks so much for talking to us on GB News. It is devastating when this kind of a thing happens, but when you've got a good community around you, you can get through these difficult times. Martin. Thank you, Wu Hollis, live from Loughborough, and the best of British to the owners there of the boat in. Good luck with the tidy up.
Now, many residents in Farnborough are furious after an apartment block was taken over by the Home Office and a luxury apartment block to house up to 300 asylum seekers. We'll speak to a local resident right after this. I'm Martin Dalby on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Earlier with Eamon and Isabel. Three, two, one, launch. I wouldn't mind a banana now. Do I like banana yeah, and toast? Yeah, 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 yeah that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like banana and toast? I love banana toast. It's a touch of cinnamon as well. No, you have to spoil it. <laughs> you have to spoil it. <laughs> Marriages. More of them are breaking down and they break down today. This day, this first working day of January, than other times of the year. A large number of people, irrespective of the cost of living crisis, which is hugely florid at the moment, who will just simply say, emotionally, this is too much of a toll for me to take. Every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Welcome back. It's 4.43. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now at 5 o'clock, I have the latest on the post office scandal as Lib Dem leader Ed Davey comes under mounting pressure for his role in the saga.
But let's get more on a story I covered on Friday as a first. And many residents in Farnborough are utterly furious after an apartment block was taken over by the Home Office to house up to 300 asylum seekers. The new block of flats, um, over 100 flats, was initially marketed as homes for rental at £1,400 per month, but now it's been withdrawn from the market. Well, joining me now is local resident Jazz Stocking. Jazz, welcome to GB News. Thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Jazz, the thing that struck me when I spoke to the leader of the council um, in Rushmore, Gareth Lyon, on Friday was the total lack of consultation. So can I get some clarity from you, Jazz, about how local residents first found out about this? I first found out about it, I think it was Thursday night, Nigel Farage ran a piece on it and uh, my other half called me into the room and said, have you seen this? And so I rewound it back and shocked actually. And then I got in touch straight away with a few friends and nobody knew anything about it at all. So I think and it was sort of shocked at first and now it's turned to anger with a lot of people. Right. And the thing is, as you said, you know, you find out from the media that in itself is a complete pig's ear. It's a complete breakdown in communications. But yet the council themselves, Jez, who are claiming that they didn't know much about it either. They were told this was a fait accompli by the Home Office. And yet, how does it make you feel and people you know in the Farnborough area knowing um, that people, you know, OK, we can say they have to have somewhere to live, but they're being given brand new luxury flats with all mod cons, £1,400 a month. And as I heard on Friday, a lot of people locally can't even afford to get on the property ladder. Well, I think it's um, people need a minimum of, say, £3,000 a month coming in just to be able to afford to live in these areas. We're living in one of the wealthiest parts of the country, but just because it's wealthy doesn't mean everybody's got money. I've spoken to people that have been ten have been told it's ten years just to get a council house in this area, you know. And, and how must those people feel? They're they're living in overcrowded houses, often with children with their parents, and they would love one of these apartments. I, I, I'm shocked myself. I mean, I'm fine on my accommodation, but even my children struggle. What my eldest son's had to move away to Northern Ireland. He just cannot afford to live in this area. It's um, I think it's a scandal too far for local residents. And, and what about the notion um, that this is brand new, people were just kind of piggybacked straight in, and the location itself is something of some concern, because as, as I understand it, Jez, it's directly opposite um, a Farnborough Technical College, some 8,000 teenage students. A lot of the parents whose children attend that college must, must be quite concerned about the prospect of over 300 total strangers being opposite where their children go to school. I think the problem is a lot of the time, as locals all over Britain, we get lied to by councils, by the government, by the Home Office. They always come along with the same old line that it's just going to be um, women and children in these places. And then when you turn up and, and have a look at even the local hotels, we've got one down the road, I would say probably 80% of people in there are single men. And there has been a crime wave in the area, even though the council will tell you there isn't. There's a lot of cover up on this. And I think if I had my children at that college, I would be very concerned. I think um, 300 people moving in, I would say probably at least 200 of those will be just single men. And I've got a feeling that we could have a problem with the local college and, and the young girls leaving there every day. So local parents probably will be concerned. I mean, we don't know, but concern can lead to anger. Yeah, and Jez, um, I put it to Gareth Lyon, the leader of Rushmore Council, on Friday that um, maybe he's just a, a NIMBY. This is the case of not in my backyard, and whether we like it or not, the situation is people come to our country um, and they have to have somewhere to live. What would you say to people who said that you're also acting like a NIMBY? Well, as far as I'm concerned, if anyone comes to England, if they haven't got the money to come here, just go or live in a tent. Many young Brits live in tents in, in fields and things. I met, I met a, a chap on, on Sunday, it broke my heart, in, in sleeping in a doorway in Birmingham. 18 years service in the RAF, nowhere to live. 
He would love to be put in one of those apartments. I, ju I just think it's terrible. Why, when we've got thousands, probably millions on council waiting lists and people staying at home with parents, and that these flats are just going to be given over to people that have just arrived in the country, probably in lorries or on a boat, or I don't know how they get here, but they shouldn't be given anywhere. As far as I'm concerned, there's plenty of villages, just put a tent in a big field and let them live there. And, and, that, and that's it. I mean, I, it's, we've got to look after our own people first. Once we get our own country in, in order, then maybe help people from abroad. And Jez, what about the, the notion um, that people are saying that this is it's a situation that's foisted upon your community, but you have to pull your weight, you have to um, do your bit to shoulder the load, and that's just unfortunately the world that we live in? Well, I don't know how big our shoulders are. Many, many people, a lot of my friends who have got good jobs are seriously struggling with the cost of living crisis. So how much more do they have to shoulder? How much more burden do they need? You know, I've... My belief is the local council, every single member of that should resign. Let's get some people in that will fight for local people. You know, we cannot keep forking out money on heating bills, on gas, gas and electric, on shopping and everything. Even your, even your TV packages has doubled in price over the last couple of years. Absolutely everything. Pe people are on the breadline. And Jez, what would you say to the politicians locally? Because as I understand it, there's been scant opportunity to talk to them. It's presented to you as a fait accompli. If the politicians, both locally and nationally, and perhaps even the Prime Minister were listening to you now, Jez, what would your message be to them? Go. We've had enough. I think the people of Britain have had enough. Leo Doherty, the local MP, he's like the Scarlet Pimpernel. We seek him here, we seek him there. He's never to be seen, never gives a word to anyone. Everyone in power at the moment, the majority of them, I know there are some good people. The Prime Minister, in my eyes, just a total waste of space. They don't think of the local people. They don't think of anybody. I mean, lots of local people. We've, we've, we've been working hand in hand with um, some locals in Chichester that have got exactly the same problems. They're hopefully going to support our cause. We've been supporting theirs. I think groups and areas will start getting together. And before the government realises, there's going to be big problems on their hands. We're going to organise a protest for this weekend coming. We want numbers there. We want big numbers. Hopefully people will turn up and voice their opinions. We need the government to know that we're not happy. Councillors, they just need to go. Get people in charge that will fight for local people. OK, Jess Stocking, thank you very much for giving us that impassioned view. And we have a Home Office spokesperson who said this. We have always been upfront about the unprecedented pressure being put on our asylum system, brought about by a significant increase in dangerous and illegal journeys into the country over recent years. We continue to work across government and with local authorities to identify a range of accommodation options to reduce the unacceptable use of hotels, which costs £8 million a day. The government remains committed to engaging with local authorities and key stakeholders as part of this process. And now some more I breaking news for you. And a victim of Jeffrey Epstein claims sex tapes were taken of various high-profile figures, including Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. And I'm joined now by GB News' royal correspondent Cameron Walker with the latest Cameron, uh, yet more astonishing revelations. Yeah, Martin, this is just coming through to us. If you remember, a US court is releasing uh, several files related to a 2015 defamation case between uh, Glenn Maxwell, who's serving a 20-year prison sentence for child sex trafficking, uh, and Virginia Dufresne. And Virginia Dufresne is the woman who accuses Prince Andrew of uh, having sex with her when she was 17 years old back in 2001. Now, that is an allegation that Prince Andrew has always denied. Now, in one of the latest uh, court documents, which has been released in the last couple of hours, as we understand it, a victim for the disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein, dubbed Prince Andrew's friend, uh, claimed that sex tapes were taken of the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, as well as Bill Clinton and billionaire businessman um, Sir Richard Branson as well. That is what the court's documents uh, confirm, uh, uh, what the do court documents disclose, sorry. Um, the lady's name who's made these allegations is Sarah Ransom, and she gave a victim impact statement as part of the sentencing of British socialite uh, Glenn Maxwell um, for ch sex trafficking. 
Now, the extracts have been flagged for documents that we've got today uh, by the firm representing uh, Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer um, to demonstrate that her claims, uh, and I quote, manifestly lack credibility. So clearly, these documents, we must, I must stress caution here, because these documents were used uh, to try and, uh, and make it appear that Sarah Ransom's claims were false. Now, uh, Prince Andrew, as I said, has always denied the allegations. Bill Clinton is mentioned many times throughout the court documents as well. There is absolutely no suggestion that there was any wrongdoing on Bill Clinton's part, and there's absolutely no suggestion that Sir Richard Branson uh, had any wrongdoing as well. OK, thank you, Camilla Waters. To repeat, a victim of Jeffrey Epstein claims sex tapes were taken of various high-profile figures, including the Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. An astonishing story, of course. We'll have more on that throughout the rest of the show. Right after this, I'm Moss in Daubney on GB News. But first, here's your weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Turning frosty again tonight and particularly in the south, it could be icy. We do have a few snow flurries, no huge amounts, but some places seeing a bit of snow come in, parts of the Midlands, southern England, working into South Wales and the southwest. So wherever we see any of those, it could turn icy with temperatures at or around freezing. Some stubborn fog patches over northern Scotland. They may well thicken up overnight. Most towns and cities dipping down close to freezing. Some on the east coast may just stay above, but for most, a frosty start to Tuesday. That fog in northern Scotland, particularly along the uh, Murray Firth towards uh, uh, Inverness, may well stick around again for most of Tuesday. Elsewhere, there'll be patchy clouds, but I'm hopeful it'll tend to break up over South Wales and southwest England. It may stay fairly cloudy in parts of eastern England and southeast Scotland, but for most, it'll brighten up some winter sunshine, but don't expect it to be warm. It's a cold one. Temperatures in the south, three, four degrees. And on that wind, it will feel even colder. Frost returns as we go through tomorrow. Tomorrow night and into Wednesday. Wednesday sees a bit more cloud across the northeast of England and eastern Scotland. Could be a few showers here. And there. here they'll chiefly be of rain, however. In the south, most places dry and sunny, but with that cold breeze yet again. And once more, the west coast of Scotland having a fine day with plenty of sunshine. Temperatures creeping up, but it's still going to be cold. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. It's 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, it's five o'clock. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Our top story today, Lib Dem leader Ed Davey is facing calls to quit for his role in the post office scandal. And there's news of a fresh snub for Prince Harry as he's not been included in Sandhurst's guide to its 200 most notable graduates. Even James Blunt made the cut and that's got to hurt. Now, So what do you make of the ongoing post office scandal? Ed Davey, here's a guy who's demanded 31 people resign over the years, yet surely this happened on his watch. Is it time for Ed Davey to get the chop? Let me know what you think. I want to hear from you. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. And we've got lots on the way, but first, here's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good afternoon to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom today is that the Prime Minister says he would strongly support a decision to revoke the former post office boss's CBE. Paula Vennels routinely denied there were problems with the Horizon IT system, which made it look like money was missing from post office branches. Hundreds of staff were convicted as a result. Some were jailed, bankrupted. Some even took their own lives after they were wrongly accused of theft. Well, the government has insisted today it is working to ensure compensation is paid to all those affected. The leader of the Liberal Democrats, Ed Davey, who was Postal Affairs Minister at the time, denies any wrongdoing. I wish I'd known then what we all know now. The post office was lying on an industrial scale to me and other ministers. And when I met uh, Alan Bates and listened to his concerns, I put those concerns to the officials in my department, to the post office, to the National Federation of Postmasters. And it's clear they all were lying to me. German football legend Franz Beckenbauer has died at the age of 78. He captained Germany to World Cup victory in 1974, then won the tournament again as manager in 1990. He was nicknamed the Emperor and helped guide Bayern Munich to three successive European Cups. His family say... He died peacefully in his sleep, surrounded by his family. 
Now, in other news today, Chris Skidmore has formally resigned as an MP and that's triggered another by-election. The government's former net zero Tsar quit in protest over what he says are plans to prioritise and politicise new oil and gas licences. That's as MPs prepare to debate the offshore petroleum bill throughout this evening. If it passes, the legislation will mandate that licences for oil and gas projects in the North Sea are awarded annually. Meanwhile, another warship has been deployed to the Gulf region by the Royal Navy amid growing tensions and attacks on international shipping in the Red Sea. Defence Secretary Grant Shapps has confirmed that HMS Richmond will join two other Royal Navy vessels on policing duties in the region. Multiple attacks have been launched at commercial shipping there, with Houthi rebels claiming attacks are aimed at vessels linked to Israel. Here, fresh ice warnings have been issued for parts of Britain as temperatures plummet and snow and sleet showers hit the country. The Met Office has in fact issued yellow alerts for southern England and South Wales, effective until the early hours of tomorrow morning. And an amber cold health alert has also been issued for parts of England in line with the government's new warning system, with the cold snap set to continue throughout the week. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer has been visiting flood-hit East Midlands areas today, promising that a Labour government would do more to protect people's homes. That's after Labour accused the government of being asleep at the wheel over flood warnings. More than 160 remain in place across the country today and over 1,800 properties have been damaged. This isn't the first time I've been out to talk to residents in this situation. I've got to get ahead of this. And that means earlier in the year, in the autumn, having a task force that brings together local authorities, the emergency response, local people, to ensure that the prevention work is done. Some of the drains that are now being cleaned could have been cleaned beforehand. The response wasn't quick enough. So I just don't think it's good enough for the government to come after the event again and express empathy, get ahead of this with a task force. That's what I would do. The actor Idris Elba is calling for an immediate ban of machetes and so-called zombie knives. The Hollywood star spoke to families of victims as he launched his Don't Stop Your Future campaign. Folded clothes, each representing someone who's died through knife crime, is being displayed in Parliament Square in central London today. Last summer, the Home Office said tougher measures on weapons would be introduced, but legislation hasn't yet been passed. Idris Elba says although deterrents like stop and search powers are working to some degree, much more needs to be done. It makes me feel sad as a society that we aren't putting as much focus as we should be on, on, on stopping this, OK? And I just, I think today's campaign launch is about just re-energising re, um, uh, the government to think about this, re-energising our society to think about this as a group and say, all right, how can we stop this? A private lunar lander launched from the United States this morning, but it has suffered a technical problem calling the mission's future into question. The issue prevented it from pointing its solar panels stably at the sun. And without the ability to charge its batteries and maintain a power supply, the mission can't proceed. Experts are trying to resolve the issue. The Peregrine Mission 1 is aiming to become the first US spacecraft to make a soft landing on the moon in half a century. It was expected to land on February the 23rd. That's the news on GP News, across the UK on TV, digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. And thank you, Polly. Now, we start with the post office scandal and Liberal Democrats leader Sir Ed Davey is coming under mounting pressure for his role in the saga. Davey was Postal Affairs Minister, of course, during the coalition government, and more than 700 post office branch managers were given criminal convictions after faulty accounting software made it appear as though money was missing from their shops, and in fact, they were accused of stealing it. Well, I'm joined now by our political correspondent, Olivia Utley. Olivia, a saga that's been rolling on for years and years and years, and yet it's taken an ITV drama for this to become front-page news again. But 
Many, many people were convicted, went to jail. Some, sadly, have taken their lives. Will they finally get justice? It seems as though now, finally, with public outrage at this enormous pitch, they might finally see justice. As you say, this is a hugely wide-reaching scandal. It has tentacles everywhere, and every political party has actually been implicated by it. It began in 1999 under Tony Blair, continued under Gordon Brown, continued under the coalition government, where Cameron was the Prime Minister, but Lib Dem uh, ministers were in charge of post office affairs, including, actually, Ed Davey, who was post office affairs minister from 2010 to 2012. He's under huge pressure at the moment. He was asked five times for a meeting by Alan Bates, and he said that a meeting would serve no useful purpose. He now says that he did uh, uh, relay Alan Bates's concerns to the post office, and the post office lied to him. That's his uh, justification. It'll be really interesting to see if that holds. Meanwhile, of course, we've got the question of when and how those wrongly convicted postmasters are going to see those convictions overturned and get their compensation. We're expecting to hear from Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary, very soon. He's been talking to ministers over various options that he could take uh, to get that compensation system going again and to get those convictions overturned. One option he is considering, which David Davis has called for, is to exonerate those uh, just over 600 postmasters en masse. As we've talked about, 700, around 700 have been convicted. 93 have already seen their convictions overturned. The rest are still waiting. Could Alex Chalk just uh, make it possible for the, the, the judiciary to overturn all of those convictions at once? Another option, which Alex Chalk is considering, is stripping the post office of its role in prosecutions. The post office, some might say archaically, has the ability to to privately prosecute people, and that is how those 700 postmasters were convicted. Could Alex Chalk strip away that ban from the post office and hand it back to the Crown Prosecution Service? That is a, an option seriously being, being considered by government, but would obviously have knock-on effects. The Crown Prosecution Service is short on resources. There are other cases, uh, so it, it's unclear whether that's the option that they'll take. What is for certain is that something is going to be done now. This, this has reached a fever pitch. A million people have signed mm. a petition calling for Paula, Paula Venels to lose her CBE. And as you say, after 20 years, it has taken this ITV drama, the, it's taken the media getting this right into the public eye for the government to sort of realise the urgency of this situation. And another thing today, Rishi Sunak, of course, said he would strongly support that move for the Honours Forfeiture Committee to consider revoking that CBE. Do you think that will happen or do you think there'll be a full inquiry and this might get brushed off once again? It'll be really interesting to see what happens with that. The Honours Forfeiture Committee get the final decision on this. It is not up to Rishi Sunak. Though now he has endorsed them uh, taking that step, they might feel political pressure to do it. The, a million signatures, that is a lot. That is a decent proportion of the country uh, asking for Paula Venels to get her CBE removed. There is, of course, the option for, for Paula Venels simply to hand her CBE back, something that the postmasters have been calling for for a long time now. My instinct is that eventually Paula Venels, one way or another, will not have her CBE, but it'll be interesting to see how much wrangling we have to get to before we get to that point. OK, Olivia Early, superb as ever. And I'm joined now in the studio by Tim Loughton, who's a Conservative MP for East Worthing and Shoreham. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Now, the next question, of course, is that of compensation. Not the, not the small mm. matter. 150 million quid is the bill thus far. Oh, that will surely, surely grow. Lee Anderson, your, your, your deputy chairman, was in the studio earlier. And I said, well, who's going to pay for that? He said, well, maybe the humble taxpayer. I said, is that fair? Why should the taxpayer pick up the bill? Fujitsu, or the company who sold this software now, has been proven to be unfit for purpose. Should they be footing the bill? Uh, I think probably yes. I, this whole story stinks. Incredible, the, mm. the scale of uh, abuse that has uh, gone on and those 700 poor 
postmasters and postmistresses whose lives have been com completely turned upside down, and four tragically took their own their own lives. This is going to involve a substantial amount of uh, compensation. The post office is uh, a national um, industry. It's government owned. That means the taxpayer has to foot the bill ultimately. But you're right. The reason this happened was dodgy software, mm. and the people who provided the post office were Fujitsu. So I will be asking serious questions about uh, having Fujitsu's head on the block and what they're going to be um, stumping up to help put this serious tragedy, uh, for some people as it turned out to be, but a, a real scandal, to put it right. And Tim, the government has considerable leverage in this issue because, of course, Fujitsu is still the beneficiary of massive government contracts to this day. Yeah, Fujitsu is, is a major international um, player, a company worth £56 billion, pounds, I, think, uh, I think it is. It makes a lot of its money in the UK and it makes a lot of its money from public contracts as well. So if Fujitsu wants to be considered for future public uh, contracts, then it needs to step up to the plate and put this situation uh, right and the inquiry that's going to happen to all this needs, needs to know why it happened and what culpability can be attached to Fujitsu as well. I think it would be good for Fujitsu before the whole story is completely laid bare to actually come forward and say we are prepared to take some of the blame and we're prepared to put some uh, financial compensation uh, as well. Otherwise it will be the taxpayer picking up an even bigger bill. And Tim, this has hugely captured the public imagination. A million people sign in this signature for th this petition begging upon for Paula Vanels to be stripped mm. of her CBE. What about Ed Davey? You know, he was at the helm at the time under the coalition government, repeatedly turned down meetings with Mr Bates, Alan Bates. Um, here's a guy who's very trigger happy when it comes to demanding sure. the resignations of others 31 times, in fact. Should Mr Davey be considering his position? Well, it's Sir Ed Davey, of course, somebody else who's had an honour since mm. uh, uh, his time in, uh, in office. And frankly, Ed Davey's been hoist by his own uh, petard. He's very quick to throw mud around, as lots of his uh, colleagues are very quick to call for uh, resignations. But it was on his watch that Alan Bates, who comes out as a real hero of all of this, came to his department and said, we need to uh, get this uh, sorted, and was effectively um, swept aside. His excuses about, oh, I was lied to by the post office. I was a minister in the coalition government at the same time as uh, Ed Davey in a different uh, department. And when there were things that didn't sound right to me, I didn't just sweep it under the carpet. I actually went to see the people responsible. I went out of the department. I would have gone to uh, speak to actual sub-postmasters and get a bigger story. I was responsible for children's social care. I went to speak to social workers. I went to speak to uh, children in care to get the real uh, story. There's no excuse for what happened there. There are other Liberal Democrats actually running the business department. Vince Cable was a Secretary of, uh, uh, of State for uh, a trade where the department is Norman Lau and other Liberal Minister, Joe Swinson. Uh, so actually they've got a lot of questions to answer uh, as, uh, as well. And for once they're going to have to answer the questions rather than raise some rather dodgy questions and hell mud as they had in, in the past. Do you think this is going to happen though? Um, Ed Davey has been on the tally today, so it wasn't nothing to do with me. I mean, I was, I was, I was told dodgy information by the post office they were li they lied to me he, he, he's he's rather slippery but again well, you know he accuses people of being slippery all the time but will he actually stand up and take this one so ed davy was the minister responsible for the post office the buck stops with the minister frankly it's a publicly owned institution he certainly should have been answering more questions rather than say to Mr Bates, don't call us, we'll call you, as effectively seems to have happened. All of this needs to come out because this has really struck mm -hmm. the, the imagination of the British public, real concern at the way this uh, has happened. Few people come out of this well. Actually, Kevin Hollenrake, the post office minister um, now, who raised this when he was a shadow minister uh, before Conservative MPs George Younger uh, raised it, uh, some uh, Labour lords raised it uh, as well. Well, very few people otherwise come out of this uh, world. There absolutely needs to be full transparency. The whole thing needs to be laid bare. Heads must uh, roll and compensation needs to be paid and the whole bill should not end up with the, uh, uh, with the taxpayer. And it needs to be done absolutely urgently. 700 people whose lives have been uh, ruined, only a handful have had their compensation. The other 600 still have these convictions uh, over their head. Uh, and I hope the government and looks as they will, will, ministers meeting now, to see how we can expedite 
uh, clearing their names. And it would seem like a rather easy political win for Rishi Sunak. He's already saying he was strong support stripping this um, CBE away. But with a million people backing this, and it's just completely captured the public imagination, surely Rishi... Um, palming this off, as it were, onto Ed Davey at the same time as saying we demand justice for the post office affected, Rishi should throw his weight behind this and try and get resolution and get justice. Sure, and, and that's why today Alex uh, Chalk, the uh, Justice uh, Secretary, and Kevin Hunrake, the, uh, the post office minister, have got together to see how we can urgently expedite this to make sure that those still with criminal convictions, whether we can do it in one fell, fell soup, I'm not a, a lawyer, but how they can be absolutely exonerated, their names uh, cleared and very publicly an apology to them as well and compensation paid because many of them lost their livelihoods, their pension, their anything else to go with it. That money needs to be made available absolutely um, urgently. And then some serious questions as to who was really responsible, who turned the other way, who didn't ask the right uh, questions, and why the software failed and what the company who provided it are going to do to make amends. Superb. Tim Lauter, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Tim, of course, is the Conservative MP for East Worthing and Shoreham. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now you get lots more on that story on our website. And thanks to you, GBNews.com is the fastest growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News. So thank you very much for making that happen. Now, the Sandhurst Military Academy has released the book naming 200 of its most notable graduates. But Prince Harry is not one of them. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. So on the one. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here 
for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.22. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later in the hour, we'll pay tribute to the German footballing legend Franz Beckenbauer, the Kaiser, who has sadly died. But more on that breaking news we brought you earlier in the show, and a victim of Jeffrey Epstein claims sex tapes were taken of various high-profile figures, including Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. Well, I'm joined now by our GB News' royal correspondent Cameron Walker, who has the latest on this explosive revelation. Cameron. Yeah, Martin, if you remember, a series of documents uh, have been coming out in the United States relating to a 2015 defamation case between uh, Virginia Dufre, that's Prince Andrew's accuser, who, who accuses Prince Andrew of having sex with her when she was 17 years old in 2001. That's an allegation Prince Andrew has always denied, um, against Glenn uh, Maxwell, who is currently serving a 20-year prison sentence for child sex trafficking, and she was the former girlfriend or associate uh, of convicted paedophile, the late Jeffrey Epstein. So what we have learned in the last few hours is a victim of Jeffrey Epstein claims that there are sex tapes taken of the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, as well as separate sex tapes um, with Bill Clinton, the former US president, and the billionaire businessman Sir Richard Brant's Branson. That's what the court's documents have disclosed. The lady who ha has alleged that these, court, that these tapes exist is Sarah Ransom. Now, she gave a victim impact statement ahead of the sentencing of, uh, of Glenn Maxwell. But these uh, allegations have come out as part of emails that she sent to a New York Times journalist at the time. Now, the reason I'm urging caution here is because the reason that these emails found their way into deposition in court files in the United States is because a lawyer, um, uh, sorry, the firm rep. Um, the firm who is representing Jeffrey Epstein's uh, lawyer against the um, allegations against him, it's all very complicated, uh, was using those emails and those claims to try and make it look like um, the lady was either give, was giving false allegations. So it's all essentially very complicated. The Duke of York has always denied the allegations made against him. There is no suggestion in these court documents that either, uh, print, uh, either Bill Clinton or Richard Branson have done anything wrong here. No, none of these tapes are in the public domain. Uh, and, of course, we haven't had any comments from the Duke of York or any of the other two high-profile figures in this case. If we do get anything from them, we'll bring that straight to you. But that's what we've learned from court documents in the last few hours. OK, Cameron Walker, thank you for that update. And just to repeat, a victim of Jeffrey Epstein claims sex tapes were taken of various high-profile figures, including Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. We'll have more on that story throughout the show. Now to news of a fresh snub to Prince Harry. He's not been included in Samhurst's guide to its most notable graduates. The Duke of Sussex was not chosen as one of the 200 prominent people who served at the prestigious military academy. Prince William is on the list and he also wrote the book's foreword. Well, I'm joined now by the Royal Commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. Richard, this is a rather embarrassing snub. Here we go again yet more bad news for Prince Harry. Why do you think Sandhurst has been motivated to do this, Richard? Well, I mean, I think in normal circumstances, and these are not normal circumstances, as you know, of course he would have been in the guide because, after all, in 2013, he founded the Invictus Games for wounded and uh, recovering servicemen and women. And it's been a remarkable success. And, of course, as we know, he saw two 
terms of duty in Afghanistan as a forward um, air controller and also as an Apache pilot. Normally, being a very prominent figure too, that would have uh, clearly meant that he would have joined the likes of uh, Winston Churchill, Tim Peake, David Niven and James Blunt. But unquestionably, the extracts from his biography, autobiography, Spare, where he actually listed the numbers of Taliban that he'd personally killed during his second term of duty in Afghanistan and referred to them as, I quote, chess pieces, uh, that was criticized by a large number of uh, figures in the military. And that, I think, as well as the fact that he's ripped with the royal family, I think is a reason for him being excluded. Harry now joins other, quotes famous traitors and cads to have been erased from history from Sandhurst's um, former life, and that includes Oswald Mosley and Waffen SS officer Benson Freeman, who attended Sandhurst and have been airbrushed out of history. That's not the most salubrious company to be keeping, is it? Well, I mean, one just has to say regarding Prince Harry, he was undoubtedly somebody who, after a very, very angst-ridden childhood, we know the fact that uh, walking behind his mother's coffin and also the subsequent trauma, we know the, the fact that this has had a, a toll that he's written about on his mental health. I mean, there's absolutely no question that he saw the army as part and parcel of his life, and there's no doubt that he will, I think, be somewhat upset that he's excluded. But behaviour such as, for example, listing the numbers of individuals that you personally killed, and also public criticism of his brother, for example, who's written the foreword to the book and is included in the book. I mean, this makes it pretty clear that why he's not in it personally, and I don't think he'd be that surprised. And Richard, do you think it's fair? Um, Colonel Richard Kemp, who's a regular on this show, said that he would have included him in Sandhurst's list, saying his service wasn't notable, but at least he was a big name. Yes, absolutely, because after all, if you have a name who is, and this is one of the things about being a senior member of the royal family, of course, you can do good and you can do good on a large scale. And it's also important to remember, I think, that Prince Harry's three charitable ventures, most particularly the Invictus Games, but also Sente Bali uh, in Lesotho and also Well Child, all of those uh, which he's still attached to, he was involved with before he was married. I mean, uh, there was a joke at uh, the Golden Globes last night, Joe Coy, the host, uh, not uh, one who's had particularly good reviews for the way he handled it, but he did make a joke which caused some laughter by referring to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and asking what they had actually done. And the answer, he said, was nothing. Some of us might regrettably agree because most of what Harry did previously. I mean, there's no doubt that that was, I think, quite rem Invictus is remarkable, but also if he and Meghan weren't trashing the royal family, which has been lucrative, I'm afraid, for them, what precisely have they done? That is, I think, a question perhaps they should be addressing themselves. OK, thank you very much, Richard Fitzwilliams. Another embarrassing snub for Prince Harry. Now, there's lots more still to come. Between now and six o'clock in a few minutes, I'll discuss the controversial climate action group known as the Tire Extinguishers, who have, you guessed it, slashed the tires, but get this, of a Tesla. But first is your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you. You're with GB News. I'm Polly Middlehurst, and these are your latest news headlines. The Prime Minister says he would strongly support a decision to revoke the former post office boss's CBE. Paula Venels routinely denied there were problems with the Horizon IT system, which made it look like money was missing from post office branches. As a result, hundreds of staff were convicted, 
jailed, bankrupted, some even took their own lives after they were wrongly accused of theft. The government insists it is now working to ensure compensation is paid to all those affected. Weather news and fresh ice warnings have been issued for parts of the UK as temperatures plummet and snow and sleet hits the country. The Met Office has issued yellow alerts for southern England and southern Wales, effective until tomorrow morning. And an amber cold health alert has also been issued for parts of England, according to the government's warning system, with cold weather expected to impact health services. And within the last hour, we've heard the German football legend Franz Beckenbauer has died at the age of 78. He captained Germany to World Cup victory in 1974, then won the tournament again as manager in 1990. He was nicknamed the Emperor and helped guide Bayern Munich to three successive European Cups. His family say he died peacefully in his sleep, surrounded by his family. And recordings are alleged to exist involving Prince Andrew, Richard Branson and Bill Clinton, among allegations contained in court documents relating to the sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The claims are part of a victim impact statement that was given ahead of sentencing of Epstein's former associate, Ghislaine Maxwell. Prince Andrew denies any wrongdoing. Those are the latest news headlines. More detail on all those stories by heading to our website, gbnews.com. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick snapshot of today's markets for you and the pound buying in $1.2765 and €1.1629. The price of gold is £1,591.83 an ounce and the FTSE 100 has closed for the day today at 7,694 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, thank you, Bobby. Now, my favourite part of the show, because I'm joined now by Michelle Jubery, of course, Jubes and Co. Six till seven p.m. Have we got Jubes? Here she is. The Jubes has landed. Modern technology, I don't you just love it when it works? Uh, lots coming up on my show tonight, Martin. Of course, the post office minister, he's giving a statement uh, to the House of Parliament at quarter past six, so we'll have the latest on that and reacting uh, live off the back of it. Of course, the conversation about whether or not Paula Venels uh, should be stripped of her CB, of course, rumbles on. I also want to ask about whether or not councils uh, should be forced to remove Palestinian flags that people have put up. Uh, Tower Hamlets, uh, in particular, is one area a group of lawyers are saying that the council are essentially perhaps committing a criminal offence by letting those flags remain. So I want to explore that as well. Fantastic um, show coming up. That thing about um, Tower Hamlets really got me going. I, I got chucked out of the underground the other night at um, Whitechapel and that entire high street looked like the Gaza Strip. There were flags everywhere, Jubes. There were flags on every lamppost all over the shop. It didn't look like Britain. But the flip side of that is uh, when Ukraine, uh, when the Ukraine war kicked off, the Ukraine flags everywhere as well and nobody uh, seemed to have a problem with that. I won't ask, by the way, what on earth you were doing to get chucked off the tube. And I'll tell you, the story that you've got coming up on your show imminently, that tyre extinguishers, oh, it's a good job I've got a few minutes between that and the, my show starting because my blood pressure would be through the roof. Who do those people think they are? <laughs> I totally agree. By the way, I didn't like the Ukraine flags either. Jubes and Co, six till seven. It's going to be a corker as ever. Lovely to see you. Especially with that massive Martin Dormy behind your head. Right then, a controversial climate action group, as we just discussed, known as the Tire Extinguishers. See what we did there. They have, you guessed it, slashed the tires of a car in Clifton in Bristol. Their aim is to, quote, strike the fear into owners of gas-guzzling SUVs and defend themselves against climate change, air pollution and unsafe drivers. But catch this, the group might find themselves a bit confused this time as they vandalised an electric Tesla, with the owner calling the event comical. 
where joining me now is the former Labour Special Advisor, Paul Richards. Paul, um, this, even by um, the standards of Just Stop Oil or Extinction Re Rebellion, is utterly ridiculous. Um, they may believe in their politics, but they vandalised one of the cars that, that, that presumably they actually want us to own. Well, do you know what, Martin? If it was discovered that these people were being secretly played, played by the uh, oil companies, I wouldn't be at all surprised because they are doing so much damage to their own cause, to their own belief uh, that we need to do more to tackle climate change, which, by the way, I share and most recent, reasonable people do. But I just think they're absolute idiots. And, uh, you know, people will be reading this news and just thinking, well, maybe... You know, we, we shouldn't side with these people that go banging on about the climate. And maybe, you know, the old companies have got a point. And, Paul, another reason these people might have been dropped on their heads is that there was the tragedy, of course, last August in Wimbledon uh, when two schoolgirls were killed, sadly, by a Land Rover. And in response, the tyre extinguishers drilled holes into the tyres of 60 SUVs in Exeter in Devon, hardly getting public sympathy once again. But also, we've seen this from the other side, Paul. We've seen the, the Blade Runners hacking down the ULEZ cameras in London. Are we approaching a new era of people taking direct action? Is vandalism the new currency? Well, I disagree with that kind of direct action. I'm a Democrat. I'm somebody involved in party politics. I believe in the power of voting. And people that like this say, well, you know, it's what the suffragettes did when they slashed up uh, paintings in the National Gallery and so on. But the difference was that the suffragettes didn't have the vote and they were wanting to be part of a democratic process. We've got the vote. We've got a free press. We've got the right to be heard through our members of parliament. And that's the way we do politics in this country. It's a very dangerous line to go down. But if you think you just, if you don't like something, you can smash it up or slash the tires or throw oil over it, whatever it might be. Um, it's, you know, it really is the slippery slope. Um, and these people, like I say, are idiots. I hope the police have the resources to arrest them uh, and to throw the book at them because, you know, it has to be stopped in its tracks. If you want to change something in this country, you can join a political party, you can stand for office, you can lobby your councillor or your MP, um, and you can engage with a democratic process that people have fought for and died for. What you don't do is take out your standing knife and start slashing other people's tyres. But have you noticed, Paul, as well, that they always seem to strike in quite salubrious areas? Clifton, one of the most um, affluent suburbs of Bristol, which is a very liberal, affluent city, certainly in that part. Um, or it's in posh supermarkets. It's always in Waitrose's or it's in Park Lane or it's in Knightsbridge. Why don't they try doing this outside the Millwall? Why don't they try doing this outside a working-class town? Slash the tyres of cars there. What do you think if they did that? What would happen to the men, Paul? Well, you know, I've been a lots of demos in my time and uh, uh, the people, the, the anarchists and the Trotskyists are usually people drawn from the ranks of the public school elite. Um, they're often the, the sons and daughters of high court judges and so forth. And, you know, their politics is infantile and their behaviour is infantile. Um, and they are people often rebelling against mummy and daddy. It's not a serious politics. And uh, that's why I say, you know, people need to get involved in the hard yards of democratic politics, um, elections and knocking on doors uh, and trying to win popular support for your position and win an argument rather than trying to get some headlines for these kind of really stupid direct actions that are, as I said at the top, absolutely counterproductive. They are playing into the hands of climate change deniers and oil drillers and all the people that are policing our climate. Paul Richards, former Labour Special Advisor. I think many people out there will be saying, I totally and utterly agree with you. These Tarquins, um, they don't know what, that they've even been born and they're vandalising electric cars to try and make us buy electric cars. You couldn't make it up. Thanks for joining us on the show, Paul. Now, the majority of police forces in England and Wales allow trans-identifying biologically male officers, that's blokes, to strip-search women. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel.
GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Earlier with Eamon and Isabel. Three, two, one, launch. I wouldn't mind a banana now. Do I like banana and toast? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like banana and toast? I love banana with a touch of cinnamon as well. No, you have to spoil it. <laughs> you have to spoil it. Marriages. More of them are breaking down than they break down today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Welcome back. It's 5.45. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, the majority of police forces in England and Wales allow trans-identifying biologically male officers to strip search women. At least 34 out of 43 forces have either implemented the policy or they intend to do so. 
And the figures were revealed by the Women's Rights Network. And I'm joined now by Miranda Yardley, who's a, who's a human rights activist. Miranda, thank you very much for joining us on the show. So a lot of people would take umbrage to this. They would think, quite rightly, with some fairness, that it's a biological woman's choice of who, who should strip search them. What would you say to that? I, I think they. I think it's an absolutely grotesque boundary violation <laughs> that you can exp that the police of all people are allowing men who self-identify as women. I mean, seriously, if somebody self-identifies themselves as a woman and they put them, put themselves in a position where they are laying hands on a woman in who, who is in a position of restraint, who has no power, what sort of man? What sort of man wants to put themselves in that position? It's, well, it's well, absolutely perhaps, shocking. I, I, I think many, many people watching this show will concur, particularly um, in sensitive situations. I mean, the, 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 it absolutely makes you shiver to think if a woman had been through some sort of sexual violation historically, only to be then told that she had to be manhandled, literally, by a man. Who makes these decisions and why? That's a really good question. Uh, I believe police procedure is down to, isn't it, down to the College of Policing? And I, I think that, well, we, we, have a, we have a government at the moment where, who members of the government have made very sympathetic noises to women who've been concerned about this. And it, it surprises me, really, that, that this is being allowed to continue. There was a story that broke earlier on today, or was it last night as well, that there were there are women in who who are being housed with with um, male mm. prisoners, or should I say, that there are male prisoners who have convictions for sexual offences who are being housed with women in women prisons. I mean, a again, we were assured that this would not be happening, and it's it, it's 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 unconscionable. It is such a malicious act against women. And it just makes me sort of wonder where this came from. I mean, if we're looking at what, about 28,000 trans people in, in the, all of the United Kingdom, a tiny percentile, and there's, and there's a lot of debate around whether the last census was actually confusing. People in areas of Britain who were less likely or less able to speak English were more likely to claim that they were trans. Surely, putting the point across, they misunderstood the question. So the actual data itself may be wrong, but at what point the people who lead police forces, people who lead the NHS, people who lead in schools, people who lead in the most sensitive areas of our lives on hospital wards decide to put such minority interests first and why? That's a really good question. Uh, a lot, what happened with prisons until oh, about the end of 2015 was it, it was subject to risk assessment. And as, as general practice, the default was that men would go in a men's prison. There was a um, there was a, a case at the end of 2015, uh, whose name I can't quite remember with certainty. I, I don't want to say it in case I've got the wrong person and somebody gets sued here. Um, but this individual was was a man who, who called himself a woman, even though he retained his. Um, um, seven-inch surprise, which he was wanting to talk about, and he was uh, he, he was arrested for an assault in a bar in Bristol, and he headbutted the um, the manager of the bar and caused quite some damage to his dental work. And of course, what happened was this guy was put in men's prison because he's a bloke, and uh, there was an absolutely huge amount of outrage. And of course, what happens is is that confronted by a screaming baying mob that uh, you know that the, um, the the whole diversity equality and inclusion infrastructure gets going and before you know it we've got this utterly perverse situation where we have sexual criminals being like foxes being put into a hen house and yeah. given a, given a, a um, you know put into okay. prison with women and it's yeah, OK, we, we, 
Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Miranda Yardley, thank you very much, purely because Pleasure. of a lack of time. And some breaking news in the last hour. German footballing legend Franz Beckenbauer has sadly passed away at the age of 78. Beckenbauer was the West Germany captain and when they won the World Cup in 1974. And he was also the West Germany coach when they won the World Cup in 1990. And of course, they beat England on penalties on the way to winning that tournament. And joining us now is the sports journalist, the legend of Fleet Street, Harry Harris. Harry, always a pleasure to speak to you. The Kaiser sadly passed away, a footballing phenomenon, one of the best players of all time and royalty in Germany. Uh, indeed, uh, I can't quibble with every word you just said there. I think, um, you know, as a, as a fan, uh, I watched him play, certainly in the uh, 1966 World Cup. Uh, I was there at Wembley for the final. Uh, and uh, obviously learnt afterwards, a very interesting story, of course, that um, he, he was asked to mark Bobby Charlton, who he obviously described as at that time the best player in the world. And he was glad for the final whistle because he went into extra time and he was chasing Bobby Charlton around the pitch for 120 minutes. But of course, Alf Ramsey had designated Bobby Charlton to man Mark Beckenbauer. That's how good Beckenbauer was, that England's best player had to man mark him. So um, neither of them actually excelled in the final um, because, because of that. But um, what a gifted player. Uh, and certainly you'd put him up there right at the top uh, alongside Bobby Charlton, certainly Pelé and the likes of that. He, he was um, different class. And of course, he invented his own position. He was a sweeper, but in front of the back four, which now we have all these kind of like holding midfield players and that, that type of thing. But he, he invented that position. And an astonishing achievement, not only as a player, but to then, as the gaffer, help Germany to lift that World Cup in 1990. OK, that might be painful for England fans, but an astonishing achievement. I believe only three people have ever lifted the World Cup as player and manager. That's correct. So you can see how difficult that uh, scenario is. But of course, you know, he was a formidable manager as well as a player and um, a great leader of the national team as a manager. But as a player, you know, he had such silky skills, just um, in incredible abilities. Um, and in 1966, he was the best young player of the tournament. He scored four goals from that kind of deep midfield uh, role. But he, he had that ability to um, move forward through the, the, you know, through midfield into attack. He actually started as a forward, as a winger, uh, and then, um, developed uh, into this new midfield role that he invented for himself. Yeah, the guys uh, um, did it superbly, sadly died away. Thank you, Harry Harris, for joining us on GB News. Okay. Now, earlier in the programme, we brought you some breaking news that a victim of Jeffrey Epstein claimed sex tapes were taken of various high-profile figures, including Prince Andrew and Richard Branson. And this claim by Sarah Ransom was in a victim impact statement ahead of the sentencing of British socialite Gillian Maxwell for sex trafficking. On behalf of Mr Branson, a Virgin Group spokesman has said... In a New Yorker report published in 2019, Ransom admitted that she had invented the tapes and in a statement, she says we can confirm that Sarah Ransom's claims are baseless and unfounded. Prince Andrew has always denied any wrongdoing, of course. Now, just to repeat, those allegations are being denied by Richard Branson's spokesperson and he says they are baseless and untrue. So, huge story breaking today. I've been Martin Dorby, three till six. Coming up next is Michelle Jubry on Jubes and Co. But before that, here's your all important. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Turning frosty again tonight and particularly in the south, it could be icy. We do have a few snow flurries, no huge amounts, but some places seeing a bit of snow come in. Parts of the Midlands, southern England working into South Wales and the southwest. So wherever we see any of those, it could turn icy with temperatures at or around freezing. Some stubborn fog patches over northern Scotland. They may well thicken up overnight. Most towns and cities dipping down close to freezing. Some on the east coast may just stay above, but for most, a frosty start to Tuesday. 
that fog in northern Scotland, particularly along the uh, Murray Firth towards uh, uh, Inverness, may well stick around again for most of Tuesday. Elsewhere, there'll be patchy cloud, but some hopeful little tend to break up over South Wales and southwest England. It may stay fairly cloudy in parts of eastern England and southeast Scotland, but for most, it'll brighten up some winter sunshine, but don't expect it to be warm. It's a cold one. Temperatures in the south, three, four degrees. And on that wind, it will feel even colder. Frost returns as we go through tomorrow night and into Wednesday. Wednesday sees a bit more cloud across the northeast of England and eastern Scotland. Could be a few showers here. And there. here they'll chiefly be of rain, however. In the south, most places dry and sunny, but with that cold breeze yet again. Once more, the west coast of Scotland having a fine day with plenty of sunshine. Temperatures creeping up, but it's still going to be cold. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard.